it was more than Robert Giscard had ever been able to boast. Robert, it must be admitted, had had to contend with one immense and perhaps ultimately insuperable handicap his vassals. Jealous, insubordinate, ever resentful of his domination, there were the curse of the South, the supreme obstacle to its prosperity and cohesion. They had, however, an undoubted right to be where they were. Many of their families had already settled in Italy before the first of the sons of Tancred had left their father's manor. The Giscard had been forced to accept them as a necessary evil and to deal with them as best he could. In Sicily, on the other hand, things were different. Though the Hortevilles had arrived first in the field with full papal authority behind them, they constituted the only fount of honour and they had taken care from the outset to prevent the establishment of any large fiefs that might subsequently jeopardize their own position. Thus it was that Roger of Sicily had become, by the beginning of the last decade of the 11th century, the greatest prince of the south, more powerful than any ruler on the Italian mainland. To Pope Urban, whose tenure of Rome was still by no means assured the Castellus Angelo was to remain in the hands of the anti-popes faction till 1098 it was clear that if the papacy were once again seriously threatened only the count would be able to provide the necessary southern support. Roger, to be sure, was not the easiest of allies. He knew his worth and, with the Pope just as with his nephew, he drove hard bargains. On the other hand he needed a strong Latin element in Sicily. Without it he would not only have found his present position difficult but would have had no religious backing on which to rely in time of crisis, and he well understood that three potentially opposing factions tend to be safer and easier to handle than two. Thus, while taking care never to offend or frighten the Greek and Islamic communities, he had from the outset given cautious encouragement to the vanguard of Latin churchmen who had arrived in Sicily in the early years of the conquest. By April 1073 a Latin archbishopric had already been established in Palermo, during the next fifteen years, as the ecclesiastical immigration gathered strength, Frenchmen were installed as bishops in Troina, Mazara, Agrigento, Syracuse and Catania, and before 1085 the first Sicilian Benedictine Abbey had been founded, at Roger's own expense, on the island of Lipari. The papacy, while obviously gratified to see the influence of the Mother Church so rapidly expanding in a land where it had been unknown only a few years before, at first viewed Roger's actions with some misgiving. Gregory VII, as we have seen, did not take kindly to the appointment of bishops by lay rulers, and though the great count never claimed the right of investiture as a matter of principle as Henry IV had done, he plainly had no intention of relinquishing his effective control of church affairs. Fortunately Gregory had been too fully occupied elsewhere to bother over much with Sicily, and Urban, though his views on the subject were avowedly identical, comma one approached the problem with a degree of diplomacy of which his predecessor would never have been capable. It was not only a question of needing Roger as an ally. The Pope, who may have been already pondering the idea of a huge international crusade to deliver the Holy Land from the infidel, could hardly come out in active opposition against the one successful crusader in the West, who after two and a half centuries had restored much of Sicily to the Christian fold. Lurking, too, at the back of his mind there was possibly a further uneasy doubt. Could he be altogether sure of Roger's own devotion to the true faith? Admittedly the Count, for purposes of practical administration, had subordinated the Orthodox churches in Sicily to his Latin hierarchy, but he had taken this step more in self-defense against Byzantine influence than in submission to Rome. He was, moreover, setting up Basilian monasteries at an alarming rate and rumors of a possible important conversion had long been current in Palermo and elsewhere. Urban could not afford to take any chances. One all that he, Gregory, rejected I reject, what he condemned I condemn, what he loved I embrace, what he regarded as Catholic I approve, and to whatever side he was attracted I incline, from a circular letter written by Urban immediately after his election, March 1088. Neither. However, could he allow the Count to claim rights which belonged properly to himself, 
and whatever may have been the primary reason for his visit to Roger at Troyena in 1088 whether it was to seek help for a march on Rome or, as Malatra suggests, to discuss Byzantine proposals for an end to the schism it seems clear enough that the two reached a mutually satisfactory agreement on the whole question of the church in Sicily. Henceforth, in return for his recognition of papal supremacy in ecclesiastical affairs, we find Roger enjoying a large measure of autonomy, making his own decisions in the Pope's name and only in the last resort as when Urban refused to elevate Lipari to a bishopric in 1091 submitting to papal force majeure. For a decade all went smoothly. In the interim Roger's daughter Constance married Conrad, Henry IV's rebel son who had allied himself with his father's enemies, and soon Sicily became known as one of the leading champions of the populist cause. Then, in 1097, Urban miscalculated. Without giving the Count any prior warning, he appointed Robert, Bishop of Troyena and Messina, as his apostolic legate in Sicily. For Roger such interference was unwarranted and intolerable. The unfortunate Robert was seized in his own church and put under instant arrest. In other circumstances and with other protagonists, such a crisis might have spelt serious trouble between Sicily and the papacy, but Roger and Urban were both consummate diplomats, and, by a lucky chance, an opportunity to settle the matter soon presented itself. Some months before, Jordan of Capua's son Richard, now grown to manhood, had appealed to both the Duke of Apulia and the Count of Sicily for help in regaining his principality, from which he and his family had been expelled soon after his father's death. They had agreed Roger Borsa in exchange for suzerainty over all Capuan lands, his uncle in return for the surrender of Capuan claims to Naples. The siege began in the middle of May 1098 and lasted forty days and it was an easy matter for the Pope, on the pretext of an attempt at mediation, to travel down to the beleaguered city. Roger received him with every courtesy, putting, we are told, six tenths at his disposal, and in the talks that followed which were attended also by Bishop Robert as a proof of the Count's goodwill he seems to have admitted that he had acted hastily and expressed suitable regret. While these talks were still in progress, Capua surrendered and its prince was reinstated, Pope and Count accordingly withdrew to Salerno, and it was there that they decided upon a formula which has led to more speculation and heated controversy than any other incident in the whole history of Sicilian relations with Rome. This formula was enshrined in a letter, addressed by Urban on 5 July 1098 to his most dear son, Count of Calabria and Sicily, in which he undertook that no papal legate should be appointed in any part of Roger's dominions without the express permission of the Count himself or his immediate heirs, whom Urban now formally invested with legatine powers. The letter further granted Roger complete discretion in the choice of bishops whom he might send to future councils of the church. Several distinguished historians of the period one have argued that by acquiring the perpetual apostolic legation the great count was obtaining rights which far exceeded those enjoyed by any other lay potentate in the Christian West. Catholic apologists, on the other hand, anxious to refute the exaggerated claims of later Sicilian rulers down the centuries, have gone to immense pains to show that the Pope in fact gave away very little, and recent research seems to have proved them right. Certainly the legatine office was withdrawn from Bishop Robert, yet it is worth noting that Urban's letter is careful not to confer it formally on Roger but merely authorizes him to act instead of a legate, legati vice. Moreover, the letter purports to be merely a written confirmation of an earlier verbal promise and though the Pope may be referring to an undertaking given immediately one Chalandon, Histoia de la Domination Normand, and Caspar, die legal in Jual de Normanis Sicilis and Hesher, to name but two. Dot beforehand at Capu or Salerno, an examination of Roger's handling of church affairs during the previous ten years suggests that he had in fact considered himself empowered with legatine rights ever since Urban's visit of 1088. This would also explain his fury at the appointment of Robert the only time in his career that he is known to have laid hands on the clergy. Eleven. This whole question is brilliantly discussed by E. Jordan, 
la politique ecclesiastique de Roger I et les origines de l'allégation sicilienne apostrophe. If, then, we accept this modern interpretation of the Pope's letter, it emerges simply as the record of a ten year old agreement from which both sides stood to gain. The powers it gave Roger were by no means absolute, nor were they long to remain unique. A few years later King Henry I was to acquire almost identical rights over the church in England. But they should not be underestimated on that account. Roger now had written authority from Rome to take decisions on his own initiative which would have been impossible if the Pope had possessed full local representation, and which gave him an effective practical control of the Latin church in his dominions such as he already enjoyed over the Orthodox and Muslim communities. It may not have been so brilliant a diplomatic victory as was previously supposed, but it was no mean achievement. Pope Urban was not the only distinguished ecclesiastic to appear below the walls of Capua during those summer days of 1098. Saint Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, who was a Lombard by birth, had left England in despair the previous October. William Rufus, having, not for the first time, made his life intolerable and was staying in the neighborhood when he received a message from Roger Borsu inviting him on a short visit to the siege. According to Anselm's friend and biographer, the monk he Adma, who was also present, the archbishop accepted and remained outside Capua until the fall of the city, living in tents set well apart from the noise and tumult of the army, and there, soon after his arrival, the Pope had joined him. The following story is best told in the Adma's own words the Lord Pope and Anselm were neighbours at the siege. So that their households seemed rather to be one than two, nor did anyone willingly come to visit the Pope without turning aside to Anselm. Indeed, many who were afraid to approach the Pope, hurried to come to Anselm, being led by that love which knows no fear. The majesty of the Pope gave access only to the rich. The humanity of Anselm received all without any acceptance of persons. And whom do I mean by all, even pagans as well as Christians? There were indeed pagans, for the Count of Sicily, a vassal of Duke Roger, had brought many thousands of them with him on the expedition. Some of them, I say, were stirred, by the reports of Anselm's goodness which circulated among them, to frequent our lodging. They gratefully accepted offerings of food from Anselm and returned to their own people making known the wonderful kindness which they had experienced at his hands. As a result he was from this time held in such veneration among them, that when we passed through their camp for they were all encamped together a huge crowd of them, raising their hands to heaven, would call down blessings on his head, then, kissing their hands as they are wont, they would do him reverence on their bended knees giving thanks for his kindness and liberality. Many of them even, as we discovered, would willingly have submitted themselves to his instruction and would have allowed the yoke of the Christian faith to be placed by him upon their shoulders, if they had not feared that the cruelty of their count would have been let loose against them. For in truth he was unwilling to allow any of them to become Christian with impunity. With what policy if one can use that word he did this, is no concern of mine, that is between God and himself. Tr. Southern. E. Adma was never the most objective of biographers, and it is difficult to believe that Count Roger's Saracen troops were either as numerous or as adulatory as he suggests. His account is interesting, however, for its reference to their master's refusal to allow their conversion. In years to come, succeeding rulers of Sicily were to incur much odium for the apparent cold-bloodedness with which they used Muslim soldiers against their Christian enemies, and for the vigor with which they were wont to oppose all evangelical attempts. Such policies may well have seemed immoral to bigoted medieval minds, but they certainly justified themselves in practice. First of all, by establishing a crack force of Saracen troops, commanded by Saracen officers and maintaining their traditional fighting methods, Roger provided a useful outlet for the military instincts and talents of his Muslim subjects, preventing them from feeling second-class citizens and giving them a pride of participation in the new Sicilian state. Secondly, he knew how dangerously religious sanctions could affect the morale of any Christian fighting force. His relations with the papacy were normally amicable enough, 
but there was no telling how long they might remain so. Only by preserving a strong Islamic contingent in his army could he be sure that, in the event of a brush with the Pope, he would still retain a body of first-class soldiers whose loyalties would continue undivided. Finally, the addition of the Saracen brigades made the Count's army supreme in the peninsula, stronger than that of Capua or even that of the Duke of Apulia himself. Rogers growing respect for the Saracens as soldiers had its counterpart in his civil administration. As he slowly won their confidence they began to respond to his leadership, and as their qualities, particularly in commercial and financial affairs, became more apparent, so the governmental posts held by Muslim functionaries increased in number and importance. In Palermo itself the governor was always a Christian though even here he retained the Arabic title of Emir, which passed into the Latin language in the form of Amoratus and from which, through Norman Sicily, our own word admiral is derived, elsewhere, in nearly all regions of the island whose populations were wholly or predominantly Muslim, government was left in the hands of the local Saracen emirs. And so, with the return of peace and security to the land, the old Arab artistic and intellectual traditions were reawakened, poets, scientists and craftsmen appeared anew and were greeted with admiration and encouragement and the foundations were laid for the great cultural efflorescence of 12th century Sicily, to which the Arab contribution was to be the richest and brightest of all. In these circumstances it is hardly surprising that when, at Clermont in November 1095, Pope Urban summoned the princes and peoples of Christendom to take up arms against the Saracen and deliver the holy places from heat pollution, his words should have had little appeal for the Count of Sicily. Among the knights and barons of Apulia, in whose hearts the old Norman wanderlust still burned as fiercely as ever, the response had been enthusiastic and immediate to such an extent that Roger Borsa, who was, as usual with his uncle's help, busy besieging a rebellious Amalfi when the news of the crusade reached South Italy, suddenly found himself faced with the mass desertion of nearly half his troops and was obliged to raise the siege. A few months later the great crusading army, marching down the peninsula to its ports of embarkation, was swelled beyond all estimates as Norman warriors in their hundreds joined its ranks, led by the gigantic Bohemond himself, with no fewer than five other grandsons and two great-grandsons of old Tancred de Horteville in his train. For the Duke of Apulia, despite the unfortunate depletion of his army, the general exodus must have come as a godsend delivering him at one stroke of all the most dangerous and disruptive elements in his duchies. But the excitement and commotion of that summer seemed to have left his uncle unmoved. Roger had had enough of crusading. The Arab historian Ibn al tells of how, at about this time, the Count was offered the assistance of a Frankish army if he would lead an expedition to Africa against Tamim, the Zerid Sultan of Mahia, in what is now Tunisia. He continues at these tidings Roger assembled his companions and asked their advice. All replied, by the gospel, this is an excellent plan for us and for him, thus will all the country become Christian. But Roger lifted his foot and made a great fart, saying by my faith, here is far better counsel than you have given. When that army is here I shall have to provide a numerous fleet, and much else besides, to transport it across to Africa it and my own troops too. If we conquer the country, the country will be theirs, meanwhile we shall have to send them provisions from Sicily and I shall lose the money I draw each year from the sale of my produce. If on the contrary the expedition is unsuccessful, they will return to Sicily and I shall have to suffer their presence. Moreover Temim will be able to accuse me of bad faith towards him claiming that I have broken my word and that I have severed the links of friendship existing between our countries. Ibn al was writing some hundred years after Roger's death. His facts are a little confused, the episode in question is most probably connected with Roger's known refusal to join a joint Pisan and Genoa's expedition against Temim in 1086. The account is therefore less remarkable for its historical accuracy than for the light it sheds on the Count's reputation in the Arab world. It is also one of the few anecdotes to have come down to us that gives us a picture, however imprecise or fleeting, of Roger the man.
about his personality and his private life we know infuriatingly little save that he certainly seems to have possessed in full measure the philoprogenitiveness of the Hortevilles. Existing records testify to at least 13 and probably 17 children by various mothers, to three of whom his beloved Judith of Evrux having died young he was successively married, but the list may not be exhaustive. The rest of his character can only be deduced from what we know of his career. But what a career it was! When Roger died, on the 22nd of June 1101, in his mainland capital of Milto, he was 70 years old. 44 of those years had been spent in the south, and 40 had been largely devoted to the island of Sicily. The youngest of the Hortevilles, he had begun with even fewer advantages than his brothers, but by the time of his death, Though still only a count and remaining the faithful vassal of his nephew, he was generally reckoned as one of the foremost princes of Europe, one whom no less than three kings Philip of France, Conrad of Germany I, son of Henry IV, and Kellerman of Hungary had sought as a father-in-law. Sicily he had transformed. An island once despairing and demoralized, torn asunder by internecine wars, decaying after two centuries of misrule had become a political entity, peaceful and prosperous, in which four aces since, as a result of Roger's efforts, several thriving Lombard colonies were now established round Catenu and three religions were living happily side by side in mutual respect and concord. One Conrad died before his father, having revolted against him, but he was acknowledged king in Italy. Here with its significance extending in time and space far beyond the confines of the central Mediterranean lies the cornerstone of Roger's achievement. In a feudal Europe almost entirely given over to bloodshed, loud with the tumult of a thousand petty struggles, rent by schism, and always overshadowed by the titanic conflict between emperor and pope, he left a land not yet even a nation in which no barons grew over turbulent and neither the Greek nor the Latin churches strove against the lay authority or against each other. While the rest of the continent, with a ridiculous combination of cynical self-interest and woolly-headed idealism, exhausted and disgraced itself on a crusade, he who alone among European leaders had learned from his own experience the vanity of the crusading spirit had created a climate of enlightened political and religious thinking in which all races, creeds, languages and cultures were equally encouraged and favoured. Such a phenomenon, unparalleled in the Middle Ages, is rare enough at any time, and the example which Count Roger of Sicily set Europe in the 11th century might still profitably be followed by most nations in the world today. Twenty are delayed while all the other Christian princes of the world have always done their utmost, both personally and by their great generosity, to protect and nurture our kingdom like a tender shoot. This prince and his successors have never to this day addressed us one word of friendship despite the fact that they are better and more conveniently placed than any other princes to offer us practical assistance or counsel. They seem to have kept this offence always green in their memory, and so do they unjustly visit upon a whole people a fault which should properly be imputed to one man only. William of Tyre, Book I Nothing now remains of Count Rogers Abbey of the SS. Trini to Atmilto. An earthquake destroyed it, with the rest of the town, in 1783, and all that could be salvaged of its founder's tomb was the antique sarcophagus itself, which now lies in the Archaeological Museum at Naples. One its church was neither large nor particularly grandiose. But on that late June day in 1101 it must have offered the mourners physical as well as spiritual consolation, and it was from its cool shadows that, the funeral service over, a dark-haired young woman stepped out with her two little boys into the sunshine. One C photograph opposite P. 257. Countess Adelaide was the daughter of a certain Marquis Manfred, brother of the great Boniface del Vasto of Savona. She had married Roger as his third wife in 1089, when her husband was approaching sixty and despite an undoubted virility to which his two sons and a dozen odd daughters bore more than adequate testimony, still without any suitable male heir. Jordan, whom he loved and who had inherited all the Horteville qualities, had been born out of wedlock, while Geoffrey, his only legitimate son, 
was a leper who lived secluded in a remote monastery. For a time it had looked as though Adelaide were going to fail in her duty, and when, two years after the marriage and with the young countess still as slim as ever, the news spread through Sicily that Jordan had died of a fever at Syracuse, one Roger's hopes of founding a dynasty seemed bleak indeed. At last, however, his prayers were answered. In 1093 Adelaide was brought to bed of a son, Simon, and two years later, on the 22nd of December 1095, she presented him with another, whom, with justifiable pride for he was now 64 he called Roger. One a stone recording Jordan's death and burial is still preserved in the exquisite little Norman church of S. Maria at Milies Pietro, a few miles south of Messina. This was built by Count Roger in 1082 as one of his many Basilian foundations. Though sadly dilapidated and now part of a remarkably ramshackle farm, it is well worth a visit. The succession no longer gave cause for concern, but the future of Sicily still looked bleak, and many of the congregation that day in the SS. Trinita must have found their minds wandering from the words of the Requiem to dwell on the difficult years ahead. Simon was just eight years old, Roger barely five and a half, a long regency was inevitable. Adelaide was young and inexperienced, and a woman. A North Italian from Liguria, she had no deep hold on the loyalties of any of the peoples whom she was now asked to control Normans, Greeks, Lombards or Saracens. Her knowledge of languages is unlikely to have stretched further than Italian, Latin and a smattering of Norman French. How could she possibly cope with the government of one of the most complex states of Europe? The chronicles of this period are so lamentably thin that we have little means of telling how Adelaide overcame her difficulties. Audricus Vitless, a mine of misinformation in many respects but often surprisingly well documented where South Italy and Sicily are concerned, tells us that she sent to Burgundy for a certain Robert, son of Duke Robert I, married him to her daughter he presumably means one of her eleven stepdaughters and entrusted the government to him for the next ten years, after which she had him poisoned. As we saw in the case of C. Kelgator, Audricus is all too ready to ascribe perfectly natural deaths to sinister causes, and this part of his account is almost certainly untrue. For the rest, it seems a little strange that Robert's name should not once be mentioned in contemporary local records, though these are too sketchy to allow us to draw any firm conclusions. Of the two greatest modern authorities on the subject, Amari dismisses Audricus's story as a complete fabrication, Chalandon, with reservations, accepts it. We can take our choice. However, she managed. Adelaide was outstandingly successful. For her ministers she seems to have relied principally on native Sicilians of Greek or Arab extraction, while such Norman barons always more trouble than Greeks and Saracens put together who hoped to take advantage of her regency to increase their own rights and privileges soon discovered their mistake. Thus the countess was able to devote much of her time to her chief responsibility the bringing up of her two sons as worthy successors to their father. Here too she did her work well in so far as fate permitted. But on the 28th of September 1105 her elder son Simon died, and it was young Roger, not yet ten years old, who now became Count of Sicily. Of Roger's childhood we know next to nothing. There is an undocumented tradition to the effect that at the end of 1096 he was baptized by Saint Bruno, founder of the Carthusian Order, who was then living in a hermitage next to his monastery of Latua, near Squillis. Apart from this, we can only fall back on the equally unsatisfactory testimony of a certain Alexander, abbot of S. Salvatore near Teles who later produced a tendentious and extremely patchy account of the earlier part of his reign. Alexander tells of how, while their father was still alive, the two little princes used to fight together and how Roger, who always came out on top of his elder brother, would claim Sicily for himself, offering to compensate Simon with a bishopric or, if he preferred it, the papacy. By this alone, the abbot suggests, 
he proved himself born to rule a theory for which he finds additional confirmation in Roger's somewhat exaggerated charity, never, we are told, did the boy refuse alms to beggar or pilgrim, but would always empty his pockets of all that he had and then ask his mother for more. Unfortunately Alexander is writing at second hand and his work, which was commissioned by Roger's sister Matilda, is often nauseatingly sycophantic. Later he becomes a useful and even fairly reliable source, but for this period he is neither informative nor trustworthy, and it is only in default of anything better that these two dreary little contributions to our knowledge if such they are have found their way into this book. There occurred, however, in these cloudy but apparently uneventful years one development of immeasurable significance both for the future of the state and for the shaping of its ruler. When in Sicily and not engaged on campaign, Roger I as we must now call him had based himself first at Troina and, latterly, at Messina, whence he could keep a closer eye on his Calabrian domains, but his personal preference was always for his old mainland castle at Milto. Here it was that he normally kept his family and here, however frequent his absences, that he had made his home. Adelaide changed all that. In Calabria she doubtless felt herself hemmed in by the Norman barons, whom she disliked and distrusted. Messina was better, but it was still a small town and life the must have had little enough to offer. S. Marco de Lanzio, where Roger also seems to have spent some of his childhood, was smaller still, though perhaps cooler and healthier in the summer months. There was only one real metropolis in Sicily, and that was Palermo a city with a population now approaching 300,000, and two centuries as a thriving capital already behind it, with flourishing craft centers and industries, with palaces, administrative offices, arsenals and even a mint. One, the date at which Countess Adelaide finally fixed her capital at Palermo is uncertain. The process was probably a gradual one but it was certainly complete by early 1112, when, in the old palace of the emirs, the city witnessed the knighting of its young prince. It was a great day for Roger. Shortly afterwards, in June, when he and his mother together issued a grant of privileges to the Archbishop of Palermo, he could proudly style himself Rogerius, Jam Miles. Jam comes. One, the Sicilian treasury and mint was to remain largely staffed by Muslims, though controlled by Greeks, throughout the Norman period. Many Norman coins continued to bear Arabic inscriptions and even Islamic ones, though they sometimes had a cross added, or the Byzantine legend Christ conquers. The Italian word for mint, zecco, is a direct appropriation from the Arabic dating from this time. The move to the metropolis was the last stage in the building up of Sicilian, and especially Saracen, self-respect. Here was final proof that Sicily was no longer looked upon by her conquerors as a subordinate province. Adelaide and Roger, by coming to live permanently in Palermo, were showing that they not only trusted but depended on their Saracen subjects for the prosperity and smooth running of the state. More important still was the effect which it had on the formation of Roger himself. His father had grown up a Norman knight, and a Norman knight he had essentially remained throughout his life. The son, deprived of paternal influence from the age of five, was first and foremost a Sicilian. Apart from one or two close relations he knew few Normans, his Italian mother, whom he worshipped, infinitely preferred the Greeks and thus the world in which he grew up was a Mediterranean cosmopolitan one of Greek and Muslim tutors and secretaries, of studies pursued and state affairs conducted in three languages under cool marble colonnades, while outside the fountains splashed among the lemon trees and the muezzin interminably summoned the faithful to prayer. It was all a far cry from Horteville Lagitchard and it infused Roger's character with an exotic strain which cannot wholly be ascribed to his mother's Mediterranean blood. This was obvious enough in the darkness of his eyes and hair, but those in later years who came to know him well, and such of his fellow princes as were to cross swords with him in the diplomatic field, soon learned to their cost that the Count of Sicily was not only a southerner, he was also an oriental. The first crusade had been a resounding, if undeserved success. Its journey across Europe and Asia Minor had taken a heavy toll, 
and there had been anxious moments at Constantinople when the Emperor Alexius, understandably disturbed at the presence of a huge, heterogeneous and largely undisciplined army at his gates, had insisted that the Crusaders should swear fealty to him before continuing on their march. In the end, however, all the difficulties had been overcome. The Seljuks had been smashed at Dorylium in Anatolia, Frankish principalities had been set up at Edessa and Antioch, and on the 15th of July 1099 amid scenes of hideous atrocity and carnage, the soldiers of Christ had battered their way into Jerusalem, where, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they had clasped together their blood-stained hands in prayer and thanksgiving. Of all the crusaders one man stood out head and shoulders above the rest. Bohemond, though no match in rank for such mighty princes as Godfrey of Bouillon or Raymond of Toulouse, had quickly shown his superiority as a soldier and a diplomat. He knew the Balkans well from his earlier campaigns, he spoke fluent Greek, he had been the hero of Dorylium and of the siege of Antioch. At Antioch he had stayed, and there he had established himself as the most powerful figure among all the Franks of Outrema. It was a magnificent performance, one that his father might have envied it set the seal upon his greatness and assured him his place in history. But it did not last. In the summer of 1100 Bohemond had led an expedition against the Danish men along the upper Euphrates, in the course of which he had been defeated and taken prisoner. Ransomed after three years' captivity, he had regained Andak only to find that increasing pressures from the Saracens on the one hand and from Alexius and Count Raymond on the other had made its position almost untenable. Only massive reinforcements from Europe could save the situation. The year 1105, therefore, saw him back in Italy. There and in France, where the following year he married King Philip's daughter Constance, he managed to raise a new army but his ambition led him astray and instead of returning directly to the east, he unwisely decided to march on Constantinople. Once again the emperor, helped as usual by the Venetians, proved too strong for him, and in September 1108, in the gorges of the river Divil in what is now Albania, Bohemond was forced to seek terms. Alexius let him off lightly enough, he was allowed to remain in Antioch as an imperial vassal though most of his Cilician and Syrian coastline was to be surrendered to the emperor's direct control, and the Latin patriarch of Antioch was to be replaced by a Greek. For Bohemond, however, the humiliation was too great to be borne. He never returned to the east but retired, broken, to Apulia where in 1111 he died. He was buried at Canosa, and visitors to its cathedral can still see, huddled against the outside of the south wall his curiously oriental-looking mausoleum the earliest Norman II mixtant in South Italy. One its beautiful bronze doors, engraved with Arabic designs and a eulogistic inscription, open to reveal an interior bare but for two little columns and the tombstone itself on which is carved, in letters whose coarse magnificence still catches the breath, one word only. Bohemvs. One, they should also take care not to miss the superb late 11th century bishop's throne, supported on two marble elephants. But as Bohemond's star had waned, another had been steadily on the ascendant that of Baldwin of Boulogne, formerly Count of Edessa, who on Christmas Day 1100, in the Church of the Nativity at Bethlehem, had been crowned King of Jerusalem. In the first decade of his reign, Baldwin, despite a youthful period in holy orders, had brilliantly maintained the supremacy of the lay power over that of the church, and had already gone a long way towards converting the poor and scattered territories of his kingdom into a strong, cohesive state. Matrimonially, however, he had been less successful. He had always had an eye for a pretty girl, and plus minus he prevailing atmosphere of his court, though never undignified, could scarcely have been described as monastic but the Armenian princess whom he had taken as his second wife was generally agreed to have gone too far. Her rumored reception of certain Muslim pirates into whose clutches she had fallen not, it was said, with as much reluctance as might have been supposed on her way from Antioch to assume her throne had not endeared her to her husband, and after a few years in which she had done little to redeem her reputation he had dismissed her first to a nunnery in Jerusalem and then, 
at her urgent request, to Constantinople, where she found the permissiveness of the capital a good deal more to her taste. Baldwin had meanwhile resumed with relief his bachelor life, and this he continued to enjoy until, at the end of 1112, he heard that Countess Adelaide of Sicily, having laid aside the cares of the regency with the coming of age of her son, was looking for a second husband. In spite of the profitable trade agreements which he had been able to conclude with the Italian mercantile republics, Baldwin's kingdom was chronically short of funds. On the other hand it was common knowledge that Adelaide had amassed enormous wealth during her years in Sicily, which was rapidly becoming one of the chief centers of the interpot trade between Europe and the Levant. There were other considerations as well. The Sicilian navy was already a force to be reckoned with, and its support would immeasurably strengthen the position of Jerusalem among her neighbor states, Christian and Saracen. Baldwin made up his mind. An embassy was immediately dispatched to Palermo with a formal request for the Countess's hand in marriage. And Adelaide accepted. She had never liked the Franks as a race, but how could anyone refuse an offer to be Queen of Jerusalem? Moreover, she had no delusions about her worth and knew that she could name her own terms. If Baldwin stood to gain from the alliance, she would take good care that her son Roger would not be the loser. Her acceptance, therefore, was given on one condition, that, if the marriage was childless and she was, after all, no longer in her first youth the crown of Jerusalem should pass to the Count of Sicily. Baldwin, who had no children living, raised no objection, and so, in the summer of 1113, the Countess Adelaide sailed for the east. Her journey was not without incident. An attack by pirates was successfully beaten off but shortly before her arrival there arose so terrible a storm that the three ships sent out by Baldwin to escort her were driven far off course into the Bay of Ascalon, still in Saracen hands, and only with difficulty managed to fight their way out. But when at last the Sicilian galleys glided proudly into the harbour of Acar, the king and all those around him saw that here indeed was a bride worth waiting for. Albert of X one of the most informative of the historians of the First Crusade, was not present on that august morning, but his account of the scene, written some twenty years later, is worth quoting for the picture it gives of a landfall probably unequalled in splendor since the days of Cleopatra. She had with her two triremes, each with five hundred warriors, and seven ships carrying gold, silver, purple, and great quantities of precious stones and magnificent vestments to say nothing of weapons, cuirasses, swords, helmets, shields blazing with gold, and all other accoutrements of war such as are employed by mighty princes for the service and defense of their ships. The vessel on which the great lady had elected to travel was ornamented with a mast gilded with the purest gold, which glinted from afar in the sunlight, and the prow and the poop of this vessel, similarly covered with gold and silver and worked by skillful craftsmen were wonderful to behold. And on one of the seven ships were the Saracen archers, most stalwart men clothed in resplendent garments of great price, all destined as gifts to the king such men as had no superiors in their art in the whole land of Jerusalem. The effect of Adelaide's arrival was not lost on the knights of Outremer, few countries of the west would have been capable of such a display. But Baldwin had done his best to arrange a reception worthy of his queen. The king, informed of his illustrious lady's arrival, went down to the port with all the princes of his kingdom and the members of his court, magnificently and variously clothed, he was surrounded by all his royal pomp, followed by his horses and his mules covered with purple and gold, and accompanied by his musicians sounding trumpets and playing on all kinds of instruments to delight the ear. So the king received the princess as she descended from the vessel. The open spaces were strewn with beautiful carpets of many colors, and the streets were swathed with purple in honor of the great lady, herself mistress of such abundance. 11 Albert of X, B.K. 12. 288 A few days later the marriage was solemnized, amid scenes of comparable splendor, in the palace of Acar, and the royal couple proceeded in state, through towns and villages hung with flags, to Jerusalem, 
all too soon, however, rejoicing gave way to disillusion. Baldwin's army had not been paid for months, Frankish barons and knights had to be compensated and indemnified for lands recaptured by the Saracens, and by the time these and other outstanding debts had been settled there was little left of Adelaide's immense dowry. The Queen, for her part, found the Normans and Franks of Outrema no more congenial than their counterparts in South Italy. More serious still, Baldwin was soon forced to admit that although he had put away his previous wife he had never formally divorced her. Suddenly a great wave of popular feeling arose against Adelaide and also against the Patriarch Arnulf of Jerusalem, to whose well-known simonies was now added the yet graver charge of conniving at a bigamous marriage. For some time Baldwin prevaricated. Adelaide bored him and he had spent all her money, but the link with Sicily was still valuable to him and he hesitated to send her away. In the spring of 1117, however, he fell dangerously ill, and Arnulf, who had been deposed from his patriarchate and then reinstated by the Pope in return for a promise to work for the Queen's dismissal, managed to persuade him that only by taking such a step could he avoid the pains of eternal damnation. The patriarch's further injunction that Baldwin should also summon his former, legitimate, wife back to Jerusalem went unfulfilled. She was still living it up in Constantinople and enjoying herself far too much to contemplate a return. But as far as Adelaide was concerned, this was the end. Baldwin, restored to health, held firm to his decision, and the unhappy queen, despoiled and humiliated, was packed off home to Sicily with the minimum of ceremony or consideration. She had never particularly liked Baldwin, and she cannot have altogether regretted leaving the rigors of Palestine for the sophistication and comfort of Palermo, but she had sustained an insult which neither she nor her son ever forgave. She herself died the following year and was buried in the Cathedral of Patti, where her tomb not, alas, contemporary may still be seen. One as for Roger. Another historian of the crusade William of Tyre was to report in about 1170 that this treatment of his mother imbued him forever with a violent hatred of the kingdom of Jerusalem and its people. The humiliation of Adelaide, grave as it was, was not the only offence of which Baldwin had been guilty, by renouncing her he also broke the promise he had given in their marriage contract that, in default of further children, the crown of Jerusalem should pass on his death to Roger. Thus when, a decade or so later, the king of Sicily was to show his strength for the first time in the eastern Mediterranean, he was acting not just as an aggrieved son avenging his mother's honor, but as a defrauded and ambitious monarch, in arms against the usurpers of his realm. One, The tomb itself is obviously Renaissance, though the recumbent effigy above it may be original. It will be found in the south transept of the cathedral, set into the east wall. The inscription describes Adelaide as Roger's mother, but makes no mention of her period as Queen of Jerusalem a chapter of her life which she, and Roger, doubtless preferred to forget. 21 The fledgling year so young son of Ali, O little lion of the holy garden of the faith, for whom the lances form a living hedge. Thou didst show thy bared teeth and the blue points of thy lances. Those blue-eyed Franks, surely they shall receive none of thy kisses. Ibn Hamdis of Syracuse the good fortune that had attended the Countess Adelaide throughout her regency only to desert her so shatteringly thereafter remained true to her son during the first few crucial years of his personal rule. Roger was barely sixteen and a half when he assumed effective power, the untried ruler of a heterogeneous state which, though prosperous, was still potentially explosive. He desperately needed a period of peace in which to flex his muscles, to feel his own authority within him, not as a mere tool of government, but as an integral part of his being. And it was granted to him. The great exodus to Adrima had drained off many of the most obstreperous of his mainland vassals and lowered the political temperature throughout South Italy. To Sicily, meanwhile, it had brought only increased affluence and the island was now richer than at any time in its history. Even before the crusade the volume of Levantine commerce with cities like Tripoli, Alexandria and Ondok, as well as with Constantinople itself had been steadily growing. 
and the Norman conquest of the south had now made the Straits of Messina safe, for the first time in centuries, to Christian shipping. To the Italian mercantile republics of the west coast such a development was of enormous significance, we know, for example, that in September 1116 Roger granted a plot of land at Messina to the Genoese consul for the building of a hospital there, and it is safe to assume that Pisa, Naples, Amalfi and others had also staked their claims. In such conditions the Greeks and Arabs of Sicily two races in which the commercial sense was, then as now, particularly highly developed were in no mind to make trouble, they were far too busy making money instead and so the young count was able to settle himself comfortably on his throne, thanking God for the priceless gift of a crusade, of which he himself, though not even a participant, was ultimately to prove the greatest beneficiary of all. This new outburst of military and commercial activity in the Mediterranean fired Roger's imagination and awoke his ambition. He did not, he knew, possess his father's still less his uncle's military gifts. The warlike pursuits which played so large a part in the education of other young Norman knights had been largely absent from his own woman-dominated upbringing, a fact which reinforced that natural preference for diplomatic rather than military methods which he was to keep throughout his life. But Sicily was no longer the geographical backwater it had been when the conquest was launched half a century before. Its economic explosion had been meteoric and spectacular, Palermo, long a thriving metropolis, was now busier than ever in the past, Messina and Syracuse were boom towns, the island had suddenly become the hub of a newly expanded and fast developing Latin world. Roger was determined that his own political influence should grow in due proportion, and that he himself, like Robert Giscard before him, should make his presence and power felt among the princes of Europe and of Africa and Asia two daughters a first step. Wealth must be converted into strength, and strength for an island realm could mean only one thing an invincible navy. The Sicilian fleet had been an important force ever since the Giscard's day, Roger I had kept it up, enlarged it, and put it to good use at Syracuse, Malta and elsewhere, but only Roger II was to make it supreme. From his day until the extinction of Norman power in the island, nation and navy were one and inseparable it is hardly possible to conceive of either without the other. The navy meant Sicily's prosperity in peace, her sword and her shield in time of war, and in the years to come the promise of its support or the threat of its opposition was to cause many a foreign power to think again. Just as the navy was more than a navy, so was its admiral more than an admiral. At first, as we have seen, the word armoratus had no nautical implications, it was merely a Latinization of the Arabic title of Emir which, after the change of capital, came to be applied in particular to the Emir of Palermo, since 1072 traditionally a Greek Christian. In the early days of Count Roger I this official had been merely a local governor. His responsibilities had been great, embracing every aspect of the administration of a city which had by now probably surpassed Cordova as the greatest Muslim metropolis of Europe but his authority had been confined within narrow geographical limits. As time went on, however, and particularly during Adelaide's regency, his position grew in importance until it covered all the Count's dominions in Sicily and Calabria. The fixing of the court in Palermo was the first and most obvious reason for the change, but there was also another the character and ability of the Emir himself. He was at this time a Greek Christian called Christodulus known to the Muslim chroniclers as Abdulrahman al-Nasrani. These two names seem to be connected the Greek means slave of Christ, the Arabic slave of the All-Merciful, the Christian and thus he may well have been an Arab convert, or perhaps even, as Amari suggests, a member of one of those originally Christian but long apostatized families which had now returned to their original faith. At all events he seems to have been the outstanding figure of his time, who received in succession the titles of Proto-Noburlissimus and Protonotary innovations which reveal how the Norman court was consciously basing itself on Byzantine models and before long found himself president of the Council of State. As such he was made responsible for the building up of the fleet of which, 
as a natural extension of his duties, he soon assumed the overall command. It may be that he was abler as an administrator than as a strategist, certainly, as we shall shortly see. He fails to emerge with any particular distinction from the one naval operation of which a full account has come down to us, and this probably explains why, from about 1123, he was gradually to fall under the shadow of his still more brilliant and dashing successor, George of Antioch. But for some fifteen years before that, saving only the Count himself, Christodulus was supreme in Sicily the first of that coruscating line of Sicilian admirals who contributed so much to the glory of their country and bequeathed their title to the world. For the historian these first years of Roger's reign are unutterably frustrating. The sources are so few, so barren of any significant or revealing information, that we cannot hope to build up an accurate picture. Just occasionally, as in the Jerusalem episode, when the external affairs of Sicily bring her into contact with other, better documented societies, some narrow shaft of light manages to filter through the mist and allows us a glimpse of a prosperous and fast developing state, for the rest of the time. Until her local chroniclers resume a coherent tale, we can see this period of her history only in the light of one of those opaque but luminous summer mornings in which the early haze is finally dispelled to reveal a blazing, crystalline noonday dot for the young Count. On the other hand, it must have been a happy and exhilarating time as he watched his power and wealth increase, learned how to wield and enjoy them, and gradually became aware of his own remarkable gifts. Inevitably there were problems, equally inevitably the Pope ranked high among them. Urban had died in 1099, a fortnight after the Crusaders entered Jerusalem, but ironically enough just before news of the victory reached Rome. He had been succeeded by a good-natured Tuscan monk, Pascal II. It is said that when William Rufus of England was told that the character of the new Pope was not unlike that of Archbishop Anselm, the king exclaimed, God's face. Then he isn't much good a remark which, though quietly memorable in its way, is hardly fair to either ecclesiastic. Pascal may have been of gentle disposition, he may have lacked that last ounce of moral fibre which would have enabled him to stand firm after his two months imprisonment, with sixteen of his cardinals, by the western emperor Henry V in 1111 semicolon 1 but he was no weakling and he was certainly not prepared to remain silent while the young Count of Sicily arrogated to himself privileges which properly belonged to the see of St. Peter. One Audricus Vitalis's bland statement that two thousand Normans from Apulia hurried to his rescue and drove Henry from Rome is without any kind of foundation. Prince Robert of Capua tried to send three hundred, but they were turned back halfway by the Count of Tusculum, Audricus is probably confusing 1111 with 1084. Roger, for his part, had taken a high handed line from the start. Already in 1114, he had deposed the Archbishop of Cosenza, and there is other evidence to suggest that he had largely forgotten his father's undertaking, made in return for the legatine privileges of 1098 that henceforth the Latin clergy of Sicily should be subject only to canon law. By 1117 his relations with the Pope had deteriorated still further, for it was Pascal who had insisted on his mother's removal from Jerusalem, and whom he therefore held to be equally responsible, with Baldwin, for her humiliation. There was certainly some acrimonious correspondence at this time between Palermo and Rome in the course of which the Pope seems to have tried still further to limit the terms of the 1098 agreement. The letter which he wrote Roger on this occasion is however couched in language so deliberately ambiguous as to raise more problems than it solves, and to have inspired more learned speculation, even, than Urban's original. A detailed discussion of it falls mercifully outside the scope of a general history semicolon one suffice it to say that there is no evidence, over the remaining twenty-seven years of his reign, to suggest that Roger took the slightest notice. One such a discussion will be found in E. Jordan's article referred to above, p. 274 n. All too soon, however, 
the young count found himself beset by a graver and more immediate problem, this time of his own making. Conscious of his growing strength, confident of his naval supremacy, he soon began to cast covetous sighs southward across the sea to the African coast. Sicilian relations with the Zirids of Africa had been excellent ever since his father's day. Roger I had been bound by treaty with Temim, Prince of Mahia, and had refused on at least one occasion that of the Persingenoa's expedition of 1086 to attack him. More recently, internal strife between the Zirids and the Berber tribe of the Beni Hamad had led to the devastation of much of the fertile North African coastal strip, and Sicily had been able to export all her surplus grain to the famine-stricken areas on highly profitable terms. In return she had begun to accept increasing quantities of Arab merchandise, and by the time Temim's son Yei died in 1116 a Sicilian commercial mission was permanently established at Mahia and there was a frequent, friendly traffic of Sicilian and Saracen ships in both directions across the narrow sea. But trade was not enough for Roger, his thoughts were on conquest, for how else could he prove himself a ruler worthy of his father, his uncle and his hort of ill name? All he needed was a suitable excuse, and in 1118 it was offered. A certain Rafi ibn Makan ibn Kamil, described by Amari as half governor, half usurper of the African city of Gabes, had recently built and equipped a great merchant galley with which he proposed to carry on a profitable trading business on his own account. Prince Yeaya, during his lifetime, had raised no objection and had even gone so far as to provide Rafi with iron and timber for the work, but his son and successor Ali proved less easy going. Claiming that the right to engage in merchant shipping was a prerogative of the prince alone, he warned Rafi that his ship would be confiscated the moment it put out of harbour, and lent additional force to his threat by sending ten of his own vessels to Gabes. Rafi, outraged, appealed to Roger. He had intended, he wrote, that his ship's maiden voyage should take her to Palermo, with a cargo of gifts which would reflect the high esteem in which he had always held the Count of Sicily. Ali's attitude was thus not only an injustice to himself but an insult to Roger. Surely it would have to be avenged. Roger doubtless treated the bit about his presence with the skepticism it deserved. He had lived too long among the Arabs to be taken in by that sort of thing. Anyway, he needed no such additional persuasions. Shortly afterwards some twenty-four of his best warships appeared off Gabes. All was ready for them and watched as they drew nearer. His timorous advisers urged him at all costs to preserve the Sicilian alliance, but he ignored them. This was a matter of principle and he had no intention of backing down. That night the Normans landed. Rafi received them well and held a great banquet in their honour but no sooner had they settled down at the table than the doors were flung open and Ali's men burst, sword in hand, into the room. The Sicilians were taken completely by surprise, they could offer little resistance. They barely managed to regain their ships and, confused and humiliated, to beat their way home to Palermo. I had won the first round.11 such, at least, is the version of the story told by the Tunisian writer at Tigani 200 years later. Ibn al makes no mention of any engagement, according to him. The Sicilians simply saw that the opposition was too strong for them, and sailed away again without disembarking. The truth will never be known though it seems unlikely that Roger's navy, outnumbering as it did Ali's ships by more than two to one, should have behaved quite so cravenly as either of the two chroniclers suggests. Relations now quickly deteriorated on both sides. Ali first imprisoned all Sicilian commercial agents in his territories, confiscating their property. Soon after, in a rare gesture of conciliation, he released them again, but Roger immediately demanded further concessions which he probably knew to be unacceptable, and on all's refusal threatened a full scale naval attack on Mahia. Ali replied with dark hints about a combined onslaught against Sicily by himself and his armor avid neighbors, who by this time controlled southern Spain and Portugal, the Balearic Islands and all North Africa west of Algiers. War seemed inevitable, and preparations began in earnest. They were still continuing when, in July 1121, R suddenly died.
His son Hassan was a boy of twelve, the cares of government were entrusted to his chief eunuch, and the resulting unrest for Saracen emirs tended to be no more amenable than Norman barons led to general confusion on the lines already familiar in South Italy and elsewhere. Had Roger struck now, North Africa might have been his for the taking, but he missed his chance. For reasons which need not concern us at present, he had chosen this moment to make his first major foray into Apulia, and by the time he had regrouped his forces the situation in Mahia had changed. Roger's Apulian adventure was, as we shall see in the next chapter, by no means unsuccessful, and it would probably have distracted him for some years from the North African question but for a new and unexpected development which brought him abruptly down to earth. In the summer of 1122 a Saracen fleet commanded by a privateer named Abu Abdullah ibn Maimun, in service with the Amoravids, descended in force on the town of Nekotra and its neighboring villages along the Calabrian coast. It was the first attack Roger had sustained on his own territory the first from Africa since his father's pact with Sultan Temim some forty years before. There must have been many in Nicotra who still remembered that fearful raid by Bernau Vert of Syracuse in 1084, but this was infinitely worse. The entire town was sacked, women and children were raped and carried off into slavery, and every object of value that could not be carted down to the waiting ships was burnt or otherwise destroyed. Roger had paid little attention at the time to Ali's threats of an alliance with the Amoravids, but now, Rightly or wrongly, he decided that this outrage had been inspired from Mahia and he held young Hassan responsible. His military preparations, in suspense since Ali's death, were resumed with a new intensity and determination. This would no longer be a war of national aggrandizement, it would be a war of revenge. Additional ships and men were summoned from Italy, a security embargo was placed on all vessels bound for Arab ports in Africa or Spain and by midsummer 1123 the fleet was ready. According to the official Saracen account subsequently compiled on Hassan's orders, it consisted of 300 ships, carrying a total of 1,001 mounted knights and 30,000 foot soldiers. As usual, the numbers are probably exaggerated, but the expedition was almost certainly larger than anything seen in Sicily since the early days of the conquest. The very scale on which it was conceived and launched makes it all the more surprising that Roger should not have led it in person. He was now 27, an age by which the average Norman knight usually had a good ten years of hard campaigning behind him. He had been married five years to Elvira, daughter of King Alfonso VI of Castile and had already at least two sons to succeed him. And this was the first important military undertaking of his career. There is no record of any major crisis elsewhere that might have retained him at home or even drawn him to Apulia, indeed, he seems to have spent most of the late summer and autumn of 1123 rather desultorily in eastern Sicily and his Calabrian domains. And so, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, we can only conclude that he did not accompany the expedition because, quite simply, he preferred not to. All his life he was more an intellectual than a soldier, war was the one art in which he never excelled. Though he did not recoil from it as an instrument of policy, he always saw himself primarily as a statesman and administrator and tended, when he could to leave the fighting to others more suited by aptitude and inclination for the job. There would, to be sure, be periods of his life during which, like any other ruler of his time, he would be obliged to take the field in person. On these occasions he would normally acquit himself well enough. But there would also be times when it was clear that physical courage was never as it was with his father or uncles, an inherent part of his character that it could be summoned, when required, only by dint of a deliberate and conscious effort. It was, therefore, under the command of Admiral Christodulus that the expedition set sail from Marsala in July 1123. Almost at once a storm arose the Normans were always very unlucky with their weather and the ships were forced ashore on Pantelleria where the troops lost no time in practicing all the things that they intended to do to the Arabs of Mahia. But they were soon able to put to sea again, 
and on the 21st of July the fleet hove to off some little islets then known simply as the Ahasi, the Sandy Ones, some 10 miles north of the town. One they seemed adequately protected from enemy attack by the narrow strait which separated them from the mainland, but this strait was itself dominated by a castle, known locally as Addemas, which accordingly became the first Sicilian objective. Before moving to the attack, Christodulus needed more information about Saracen strength in Mahia itself. A detachment of cavalry was put ashore under cover of darkness and headed south towards the town, and the following morning the admiral personally led 23 ships on a similar sortie to brief himself on the maritime defences. One, there is some doubt as to which precisely these islands were. My own inclination is to identify them with the Guria group, but the area is full of shallows and shoals and the whole conformation may well have changed significantly in eight centuries. He was not gone for long, the most cursory inspection was enough to convince him that, from the sea at any rate, Mahia was virtually impregnable. To a commander who thought largely in terms of naval power, this was a serious blow, but worse was to come, for he returned to the islands to find the Sicilian camp in desolation. Somehow a narrow braiding party had managed to cross the straits, liquidated such opposition as it had encountered, sacked the commissariat and returned with a rich plunder of arms and equipment. Suddenly Christodulus saw his whole expedition threatened with failure. That night, in what was left of the camp, Sicilian morale was at a very low ebb indeed. Meanwhile, however, the admiral's young lieutenant George of Antioch had not been wasting his time. This extraordinary man, whose imagination and initiative were soon to make him famous throughout the Mediterranean, had been born in Antioch of Greek parents, but at an early age he had accompanied his father to North Africa where they had both taken service with Sultan Temim. On Temim's death, George found himself on bad terms with his successor, yea, uh, he probably also recognized that it was Palermo, and not Mahia that held the key to future power in the Mediterranean. One Friday morning in 1108, while his Muslim superiors were all at prayer, he accordingly disguised himself as a sailor and slipped onto a Sicilian ship that was lying in the harbour. It took him to Palermo, where he went straight to the palace and presented himself for government service. Within a few years, first in the revenue department and later on an official trade mission to Egypt, George established himself as one of the ablest and most devoted servants of the Sicilian state, and won the favour of Christodulus and of the Count himself. It was not surprising, his qualifications alone made him unique. Here was a skilled administrator, a Christian bilingual in Greek and Arabic and a fine seaman whose knowledge of North Africa's coastal waters matched his understanding of her political, economic and diplomatic affairs. Thus, when Christodulus had begun to plan his expedition against Mahia, he had had no hesitation in appointing the brilliant young Levantine as his second in command. And George, for his part, had not been slow in justifying the appointment. By means unknown, he quickly succeeded in suborning the garrison commanders of Addemas, and on the third day after their arrival, the Sicilians gained possession of the fort without a struggle and installed their own garrison, estimated by Attigani at a hundred men. Here was victory of a kind, but even this was to be turned, all too soon, to defeat. In the two years that had passed since the death of Ali, his son Hassan, though still only fourteen, had managed to assert his authority over most of the country, and this unprovoked invasion for he appears to have had nothing to do with the Nicotera raid was just what he needed to rally the waverers to his banner. At the first approach of the Sicilian fleet he had proclaimed the Jihad holy war on the infidel and on the 26th of July, the fourth night after the landing, he struck. His army advanced quietly from the south, under cover of darkness, and then suddenly, with a great shout of Akbar Allah. Which, the chroniclers tell us, caused the very earth to tremble, flung itself against Addemas. Once more we are forced to rely on later Arab sources for the story of the battle that followed, though Attigani reproduces the text of the official report circulated by Hassan immediately after his victory. We may therefore suspect, even though we cannot entirely discount, 
tales of the blind panic that seized the invading army, of the headlong rush to the ships, of the terrified cavalry pausing only to cut the throats of their horses rather than see them fall into Saracen hands. What seems certain is that Roger and his advisers had again miscalculated. Pride in their fleet had led them to neglect the land army and to underestimate the strength of the African opposition. It was their second humiliation in five years, and on this occasion, trounced by a child of fourteen, they had lost their honor and a good deal more besides. Safely aboard their ships and out of range of Hassan's archers, the Sicilians regained a little of their morale enough, at least, to enable them to assess the situation. Their main concern now was for the garrison still holding out at Adema's. Christodulus was unwilling to leave them to their fate without making an attempt at rescue. For a week his galleys hovered off the coast awaiting their opportunity, but they waited in vain. The Muslims, well aware of Sicilian intentions, maintained ceaseless vigilance over the castle, and at last, with his own supplies beginning to run short, the admiral saw that the situation was hopeless. He gave the order to depart, and his fleet spread its sails to the wind and vanished over the northern horizon. In the whole unedifying campaign, it was now left to the garrison to show the first and last flicker of Sicilian spirit. All attempts to buy their lives from the Saracens having failed, they resolved to sell them dearly. They held out as long as they could, then on the 10th of August, their supplies of food and water alike exhausted, they burst out from Addema's sword in hand. They were slaughtered to a man. Meanwhile their returning comrades had once again run into bad weather, many ships were lost, and of the three hundred that had sailed so confidently from Marsala a month before, only a hundred according to Hassan's claim returned to Sicily. Virtually overnight, young Hassan whose appreciation of the value of publicity and whose technique in its handling marks him out as a ruler far in advance of his time had become the hero of Islam, to be celebrated by poets from Cordova to Baghdad. Roger, on the other hand, had suffered a loss of prestige from which he would take long to recover. The first important military enterprise of his reign. His first venture into the international field to prove himself a major power in Europe, had ended in fiasco. He does not seem to have looked for scapegoats. Christodulus, who must be held largely responsible for the disaster, was to decline in influence from this time, but he was neither disgraced nor dismissed, while George of Antioch, whose initial capture of Addemus was the only triumph however short-lived of the whole campaign emerged with his reputation untarnished. But for all the Christians in Sicily it was a bitter blow, and a contemporary Arab historian one reports an eyewitness account of a Frankish knight in Roger's audience chamber, tearing at his beard until the blood streamed down his face and swearing revenge. The Count himself, though less demonstrative, must have felt much the same. There was a strong streak of vindictiveness in his character, and he never forgot an injury. But he was also a patient man, and he had no intention of risking his reputation still further with a third attack not, at least, for the moment. Hostilities with Hassan continued for some years, but only in a desultory way, an alliance which Roger was to form in 1128 with Count Raymond of Barcelona was directed principally against the Amoravids of Spain, rather than the Zerids, and anyway it came to nothing. By then, However, he had preoccupations elsewhere. He was to experience many more triumphs and disasters before that day, just a quarter of a century later, when George of Antioch would carry his banner proudly into Mahia and set the record straight at last. One Abu S. Salt, quoted by Amari, Storia de Musulmani di Sicilia, Volume Mill, p. 387.22 Reunification Ducal towns like Salerno, Troia, Melfi, Venosa, and others which were left without protection of their lord, were seized with tyrant force by this man or by that. And each man did that which seemed good in his own eyes, for there was no one to say him nay. And since none feared punishment in this life, so did men deliver themselves up more and more freely to evil deeds. Thus it was not only travellers who journeyed in fear of their lives, but the very peasants themselves, who could not even till their own fields in safety, 
what more can I say? If God had not kept alive a scion of the Giscard's line to preserve the ducal power, the whole land would surely have perished of its own wickedness and cruelty. Alexander of Teles, Book I, Ch. I. During the forty odd years that had elapsed since Robert Giscard's death, the fortunes of the Duchy of Apulia had suffered a steep and steady decline. Roger Borsa, plodding miserably in his father's footsteps, had done his pathetic best to hold it together, and indeed after the submission of Capua Indiana 1098 one could even boast technical dominion over all South Italy more than Robert had ever been able to achieve. But Capua, like most of his other successes, had been won only by courtesy of his uncle, the Count of Sicily, who always demanded territorial concessions in return, and when, after the Count's death, the poor Duke of Apulia found himself largely deprived of Sicilian help. His patrimony began to disintegrate faster than ever into anarchy. Roger Borsa died in February 1st in, a week or so before his old enemy Bohemond and ten days after Pope Pascal had been carted off by an implacable Henry V into captivity, still pleading in vain for Norman assistance. He was laid to rest in his father's cathedral of Salerno, where his two may somewhat unsuitable 4th century sarcophagus carved with 1 CP. 273. Dot figures of Dionysus and Ariadne, but covered with a contemporary representation of its present occupant in high relief stands in the south aisle. For all his inadequacies as a ruler, he had been a good and upright man in his way, but his death was not widely mourned outside his immediate family and the churches and monasteries he had so loved to endow as, in particular, the Abbey of La Carva near Salerno where prayers are still offered every evening after Compline for the repose of his soul. 11 in a letter dated S.D. Valentine's Day 1966. The keeper of the monastic archive, Dom Angelo Mifsud, OSB, writes that the gratitude of the monks of La Carva towards their illustrious benefactor has not ceased, nor has it ever been interrupted. He was succeeded by a child William the youngest and sole survivor of his three sons, whose mother, Elaine of Flanders, now assumed the regency. It was an unfortunate state of affairs to arise at such a moment, when a strong hand was more than ever needed, and it was made more unfortunate still by the death of Bohemond. If he had lived, he might have seized control and saved the dukedom, as things turned out, he left his widow, Constance of France on the throne of Taranto, governing on behalf of their infant son Bohemond II. Thus, with the country in chaos, the Pope in prison and a strong-willed and determined emperor encamped only a few miles from Rome, South Italy found itself under the titular authority of three women Adelaide, Elaine and Constance all of them foreigners and two without the slightest experience of politics or government. It was small wonder that, particularly among the Lombard populations, the general atmosphere of demoralization and hopelessness should have developed into a great resurgent wave of anti-Norman feeling. What advantage, men asked, had these brigands ever brought to Italy? In the century since their arrival, hardly a year had passed without its quota of ravaged towns and devastated harvests, without its addition of further pages to the South's sad history of bloodshed and violence. Here were the destroyers of the old Lombard heritage, yet they had proved incapable of setting up anything lasting in its place. The country had only one chance of salvation Henry the Emperor who, having just dealt so successfully with the Pope, would now doubtless turn his attention to the Normans themselves. But Henry did nothing of the sort. He marched his army north instead of south leaving Pascal by now free again and growing in confidence with every step the emperor took away from Rome more closely linked than ever to the Normans, his only southern allies. His dependence on them was to increase still further after the death, in 1115, of the seventy-year-old Matilda of Tuscany, and meanwhile the Duchy of Apulia continued on its smoldering course. The regent Elaine, too, died in 1115. Her son William was described by Romuald, Archbishop of Salerno, as generous, kind, humble and patient, pious and merciful and much beloved by his people, he also, it seems, 
was a great respecter of church and clergy. Unfortunately the good archbishop had used almost exactly the same words when speaking of Roger Borsa, and William was soon revealed as being even more disastrously incompetent than his father had been before him. Whereas Roger Borsa had at least tried to make his presence felt and, with his uncle's assistance, had occasionally even succeeded William hardly seemed capable of making the effort. He never lifted a finger, when Henry V descended once again on Rome in 1117, to assist his papal suzerain who had confirmed him in his rank and titles only three years before, it was to Capua, not to Salerno, that the wretched Pope had to turn in his hour of need. Nor was he any more effectual within his own dominions. Throughout South Italy his vassals had taken the law into their own hands, all were perpetually at loggerheads, and even a long drawn out civil war in Bari, culminating in the murder of its archbishop, the imprisonment of Princess Constance and the enthronement of a usurper, Grimoald, elicited only a token protest from the Giscard's grandson. Such was the chaos which prevailed when, in 1121, Roger of Sicily decided that the moment had come to intervene. The reasons for his timing are not altogether clear, nor do we have any certain knowledge of his area of operations, though these were presumably first directed against those regions of Calabria which had not already been acquired by his father in return for services rendered. But whatever the details, the expedition proved even more successful than Roger could have hoped. Ignoring the entreaties of the new pope, Calixtus II, who was anxious to do all he could to buttress his ineffectual neighbour against the growing threat of Sicily, he manoeuvred his cousin during the next twelve months to no less than three separate treaties. It was not a difficult task. William was not only weak militarily, he was also desperately short of money, so that even when he could assemble an army in the field he usually found himself quite unable to pay it. Roger, for his part, always preferred to make his purchases with gold rather than blood, and thus it was that all three sets of negotiations seemed to have been conducted on a largely financial basis. The last of them actually came about through an appeal from William for help, and the account by a local chronicler one of the incident reveals as much about the character of the duke himself as it does about the state of his dukedom. One fall go of Benvento. And when, William, was come to the Count of Sicily, he wept, saying, Noble Count, I appeal to you now in the name of our kinship and because of your great riches and power. I come to bear witness against Count Jordan, of Ariano, and to seek your aid in avenging myself upon him. For recently, when I was entering the city of Nasco, Count Jordan rode out before the gates with a troop of knights, and showered threats and insults upon me crying, I will cut your coat short for you, after which he plundered all my territory of Nasco. Since I have not sufficient strength to prevail against him, I had perforce to endure his offences, but now am I eagerly await my revenge. Roger, as usual, had asked his price, and by the summer of 1122 he had gained possession not only of all Calabria that was not already his first pledged for a consideration of 60,000 peasants and subsequently surrendered to him outright but of those halves of Palermo and Messina which had heretofore technically remained ducal property. Even now he kept up the pressure against his cousin particularly around the territory of Montescaglioso in the instep, as it were, of the peninsula but his initial object had been achieved. For the rest, he could afford to bide his time. He had not very long to wait. The next two or three years made it plain that Duke William and his Lombard wife could expect no children, and William himself may have had intimations of an early death. At all events he accepted, in 1125, an invitation to meet the Count at Messina to discuss the future of his duchy, and there it was that, in return for another heavy subsidy, he formally recognized Roger as his heir. On the 25th of July 1127, at the age of thirty, Duke William of Apulia died in his turn at Salerno. His wife Gaitelgrima, who loved him, cut off her hair to cover his corpse, it was then laid, as his father's had been, in an antique sarcophagus and placed in the cathedral. One like Roger Borsa, William seems to have been popular enough as a man, Falco, 
the Lombard chronicler of Binvento who hated the Normans and all they stood for, has left us a moving account of how the people of Salerno flocked to the palace to look for the last time on a ruler who was lamented more than any duke or emperor, before him. But William had shown himself unworthy of his name and of his throne, and with his death the once great duchy of Apulia flickered ingloriously to its end. One the sarcophagus, which is adorned with a frontal relief of Meleja and the boar, is Roman, and of the third century. It now stands beneath the arcade just outside the main entrance. He died as incompetently as he had lived, for, while occupied to his last breath in making bequests to Monte Cassino, La Cava and other favoured foundations, he seems to have forgotten, deliberately or otherwise, to ratify his promise to Roger over the succession. Certainly no mention of the matter appeared in his will, worse, his disastrous anxiety to please everybody had apparently led him to make similar promises elsewhere. According to one report to the dying duke, in an access of piety, had crowned his other endowments by leaving his entire estate to the Holy See, while William of Tyre, the great historian of Outrema, speaks of an arrangement he had made with Bohemond II before his departure to the Holy Land in 1126, according to which the first to die, if he left no issue, should bequeath his dominions to the other. Thus, on his cousin's death, Roger found himself not, as he had expected, the sole and unquestioned heir to South Italy but merely one of a number of rival claimants. Two Walter of Thouan in his life of Charles, Count of Flanders, to whose account Ordericus Vitalis, BK 12, CH 44, lends additional strength. By this time young Bohemond was too far away to cause trouble, but Pope Honorius II was very much harder to ignore. For more than sixty years, Ever since Alexander II had discovered the advantages of playing Robert Giscard and Richard of Capua off against each other, it had been papal policy to keep the Normans divided. Honorius, a man of humble origins but considerable ability, was well aware of the danger of allowing the Count of Sicily to seize his cousin's realm and thus bringing an influential, self willed, and ambitious ruler to the very threshold of the papal states. Moreover, as suzerain of all South Italy, he had no need to assert his own claims to Duke William's inheritance, if he could merely show Rogers to be invalid, the Duchy of Apulia would revert to him by default. He believed, too, that he could count on the support of the Norman baronage. Several of its members had already taken advantage of Duke William's death to make formal declaration of the independence they had long enjoyed in practice and many others were determined to prevent the duchy from reconstituting itself in the firm, authoritative hands of the Count of Sicily. One not to be confused with the anti-pope, also styled Honorius II, who had so complicated the life of Alexander II some sixty years before. Against such opposition, Roger knew that his best hope lay in being able to present the Pope and his allies with a fait accompli, and in the first days of August he sailed with a hastily gathered fleet of seven ships, to Salerno. His reception was frigid. The widespread grief at William's death had not apparently prevented an anti-Norman faction from immediately seizing control of the city, the gates were closed against him, and, to the protestations of his spokesmen that their lord had come in peace, to take possession of his duchy by a hereditary right confirmed in person by the late duke, the Salernitans replied simply that they had suffered too much and too long from Norman occupation and that they could tolerate it no more. But the Count would not take no for an answer. Day after day, with quiet determination, he urged his claim. Tension gradually mounted, the city elders, courteous at first, grew hostile, but even after one of his chief negotiators was murdered by a Salernitan mob, Roger preserved his calm and all the time his ships remained in full view, firmly anchored in the bay. At last his patience was rewarded. He soon managed to make secret contact with the pro-Norman party in the city led by Archbishop Romuald, and it was they who finally persuaded their recalcitrant fellow citizens to submit to the inevitable. In existing circumstances Salerno would not in any case be able to maintain its independence, 
Surely it was wiser to negotiate while the Count was still prepared to offer favorable conditions than to risk the sort of siege by which his uncle had captured the city half a century before. And so, on the tenth day, the Salernitans came to terms. They would accept Roger, they promised, as their duke, on three conditions, first, that the fortifications and castle should remain in their hands, second, that they should never be conscripted into military service more than two days' march from Salerno, and thirdly, that no Salernitan should be imprisoned without proper trial. Roger had no time to waste, he accepted. The gates were opened, and he made his ceremonial entry into the city, where the Bishop of Capixio, traditional entrainer of Salernitan princes, anointed him Duke of Apulia. It was a near bloodless victory a victory of patience and diplomacy the kind Roger liked best, and it was followed at once by the submission of Amalfi on similar lines. Meanwhile Count Rinul for Valife, husband of Roger's half-sister Matilda, had hurried south to greet his brother-in-law and pledge his support. All he asked in return was that the new duke should grant him suzerainty over his neighbor the Count of Ariano. The request was well-timed, Count Jordan of Ariano. Duke William's persecutor, had been killed the previous week, and his son was hardly in a strong position to object. Roger had no wish to see Rhineulf, whom with good reason he heartily mistrusted, any more powerful than he was already, but he needed his help. Once again he agreed. It was a decision he would live to regret. The news of Roger's success reached Pope Honorius at Benvento, where he had gone to keep a closer watch on developments. It caught him largely unprepared, but now he too acted with decision, and sent a message to Roger at Salerno, formally forbidding him on pain of anathema to assume the ducal tide. He might have saved himself the trouble, only two days after his own arrival a troop of 400 cavalry appeared outside the walls of Benvento with Roger at their head. It was the second time in a week that he had taken the Pope by surprise, but on this occasion he may well have been equally surprised himself. His journey to Benvento seems to have been made in response to a message he had received from certain supporters in the city, congratulating him on his succession and assuring him of their goodwill. It had probably encouraged him to think that even this outpost of papal power in the south might be his for the taking in which case the presence of Honorius in his palace must have come as something of a shock. Roger was anxious not to antagonize the Pope unnecessarily while there still remained a chance of obtaining his recognition, but Honorius was not like the men of Salerno arguments, promises and bribes alike left him cold. In such circumstances to delay in Benvento was pointless. Instructing the local barons, whom he knew to be on his side, to keep the papal troops occupied by harrying the city and its surroundings till further notice, the count accordingly left with his own army for Troia. From here, the gateway to Apulia and the scene of one of the earliest Norman triumphs in Italy, he passed to Melfi, where his new dukedom had had its first uncertain beginnings almost a century before, and, as he rode, he must have gazed over the plain of Apulia to where the dark massif of the Gargano crouched on the horizon sheltering, somewhere in its depths, the cave of the Archangel. Roger would have been brought up on Malaterra's history, and the first sight of a land he knew so well by repute may have added still further to his conviction that he and he alone was born to rule it. The people of the towns and villages through which he passed seemed to share this view as he continued southeast along the foot of the mountains, he was everywhere acclaimed with apparent rejoicing. The end of August found him, with a great gathering of bishops, barons and notables, including his emirs Christodulus and George of Antioch, at Montes Caglioso, thence, moving slowly through loyal Calabria, he at last reached Reggio where he received solemn recognition of his Calabrian claims, and before the onset of winter he was back in Sicily. The unexpected warmth of his reception throughout the dukedom from the moment he had left Salerno had persuaded Roger that his position was already secure. Only the Pope was still holding out against him, but sooner or later even the Pope was bound to see reason. And if he did not, what harm could he do without a single powerful ally in the south? So at least Roger must have reckoned, 
never otherwise would he have taken the huge risk of returning at such a moment to Sicily and leaving the field free for his enemies. Roger's lightning progress had certainly given him the advantage of surprise, but its very speed carried its own dangers. The towns at which he had stopped, the barons through whose fiefs he had passed, had had no opportunity to take stock of the situation or to consult one another. Thus, unprepared and undecided, they were virtually forced to pay lip service to his claims an obligation which they performed the more readily in the knowledge that these claims had no validity until they were recognized by the Pope. And Roger, in the exhilaration of his success, had believed them. Honorius had been slower off the mark, and had been further obstructed by the gadfly tactics of Roger's partisans round Benvento. But he had lost no time in raising support, and by the end of October had rallied to his cause most of the leading barons of the South Grimoald of Bari, Robert, Dankard, and Alexander of Conversano, Geoffrey of Andria, Roger of Ariana and, the moment his brother-in-law's back was turned, Rhinul of Alife, who had pledged his allegiance to the new duke only two months before. Meanwhile the citizens of Troia, under the guidance of their bishop, William Comer I had also revised their opinions, and it was at Troy that Honorius's villainous crowd all of whom had long histories of faithlessness and rebellion behind them assembled in November and, in the presence of the Pope himself, bound themselves in solemn league against the usurper. A few weeks later they received a further addition to their strength Prince Robert II of Capua who had just succeeded his father and was crowned on the 30th of December. Point one Bishop William's portrait can still be made out on the bronze doors of Troia Cathedral, which date from 1119. Near it is an adulatory inscription, describing him as liberator patri and adding that in the year of the death of Duke William of Salerno the people of Troia destroyed their citadel and fortified the city, in the cause of liberty, with walls and a palisade. He was, we are told by Falco, a puny creature, of delicate constitution, he could endure neither labor nor hardship. But Honorius, overjoyed by this opportunity of reviving the old Apulia Capua counterpoise, determined to take full advantage of the occasion. Having failed, Falco tersely points out, to achieve anything good or useful in Benvento, he rode to Capua to attend the ceremony in person, and there, before the assembled congregation of Robert's vassals, he delivered himself of a passionate oration in which, after dwelling at length on the atrocities committed by Roger's men against the Benventans, he confirmed the counter's excommunicate and granted indulgences to all those who should take up arms against him. The movement was beginning to assume all the trappings of a crusade. Away in Palermo, Roger had recognized his mistake. Once again, just as in the North African affair three years before, he had underestimated the opposition. But this time he was less concerned. It was typical of him that even now, with the Papal League already massing its forces, he should have tried to buy Honorius off with the surrender of two towns Troia and Montefusco and a substantial sum of money. Only when these attempts failed did he begin serious preparations for war, and still he seemed to be in no particular hurry. It was not until May 1128 that he returned, with an army estimated at 2,000 knights and 1,500 archers, to the mainland. His plan of campaign was to assure himself of the southern half of the dukedom, where the forces of the League were at their weakest, before pitting himself against the main body of the opposition in the north. Hastening through Calabria, to which his title was unquestioned, he therefore struck straight across to those regions around the heel of Italy which his cousin Bohemond, before departing for the Holy Land, had left in the joint care of the Pope and Alexander of Conversano. It was a wise decision. Taranto, Otranto and Brindisi surrendered without demur, and by mid-June Roger was in undisputed control of all Italy south of the Brindisi-Salerno line. The Pope, meanwhile, had been in serious difficulties. Rhinul for Valife and Robert of Capua the first through self-interest, the second through pusillanimity were threatening to withdraw from the League, while Roger's supporters had increased their pressure on Benvento. It was already midsummer before Honorius made sure of his allies and led them to the relief of his city, only then could he concentrate his full attention on Roger in Apulia.
Early July found him and his forces in the region of Bari, still having encountered neither sight nor sound of the enemy, then, turning towards the southwest, he advanced to a point on the Bradano, no longer identifiable, where the shallow, stony riverbed provided an easy ford, and it was here that he saw the Sicilians waiting for him, strongly entrenched among the hills on the farther bank. Roger had the advantage of position, his army was fresh and rested, and his Saracen shock troops were probably eager for the fray. Yet, typically, he refused to attack. Alexander of Telles sycophantically suggests that veneration for the Pope restrained him, this seems highly improbable. Far likelier is it that the size of the papal army, together with his own instinctive aversion from unnecessary bloodshed, convinced the Count that there were other, better ways of gaining his objective. He was right. For more than a month the two armies faced each other, as one attempt after another failed to lure Sicilians down from their vantage point. Meanwhile Honorius's feudal levies, who could be conscripted only for a limited period in any one year, grew increasingly restive, quarrelling broke out, as it always did, among the various league members, and the fierce July sun beat remorselessly down on the unprotected papal camp. From his shady retreat on the opposite hillside Roger could imagine the Pope's discomfiture, and he was not surprised to receive a message one night informing him that His Holiness might, after all, be prepared to negotiate. And indeed Honorius had no choice. He was now beginning to understand what Roger had perhaps known all along that his league was too facile to last, its individual members too long accustomed to independence and lawlessness to be able to sink their differences in a common cause. Already they were at each other's throats, soon they might well be at his, and Robert of Capua, who had, predictably, fallen ill and was now lying groaning in his tent, was not the only one to be speaking of giving up the struggle. The Pope also saw that he was faced with an adversary too powerful to be crushed, and with too much moral right on his side to be dismissed out of hand. South Italy needed peace so much was certain and although the Count of Sicily could be trusted to disrupt that peace for as long as the dukedom were denied him, he might also be the one man capable of imposing it if he were given the chance. The danger of accepting so formidable a figure as a neighbor was still undeniable but it was a risk which would have to be taken. The negotiations, which were conducted on the papal side by the papal chancellor, Cardinal Aim de Ves, Maria Novla, and by Sensius Franipani, took place at night in conditions of the utmost secrecy, for Honorius was understandably anxious that his allies should not hear of their betrayal until his dispositions were made. He was a proud man and now thought only of saving his own face he seems to have made no effort to obtain terms for anyone else. Roger too knew just what he wanted in vestigio as Duke of Apulia, under papal suzerainty as always but with no other strings attached. Granted this, and provided only that his own dignity were preserved, he was prepared to fall in with Honorius's wishes, he had no desire to humiliate him unnecessarily. And so it was agreed. Nothing would be done on the spot. But if Roger would come himself to Benvento and formally seek investiture, it would no longer be denied him. The barons of the League, informed of the cessation of hostilities and somehow dissuaded from taking their vengeance on the papal person, dispersed in fury, and Honorius set off for Benvento to await his distinguished visitor. Roger arrived early on the 20th of August and set up his camp on Monte Esvalice, just outside the city. Three more days of negotiation followed on points of detail. There could, he explained, be no further question of surrendering to the Pope the towns of Troy and Montefusco which he had offered him some months before, but he would willingly swear to respect the papal status of Benvento and even if His Holiness insisted guarantee the continued independence of Capua. This last concession a final pathetic attempt on the part of Honorius to preserve that traditional balance of power by which he had always set so much store must inwardly have irked him, certainly Robert of Capula had done time enough to deserve such consideration. For the moment, however, the matter was unimportant it could always be renegotiated later if necessary. By the evening of the 22nd of August everything was settled. On one point, however, 
the Count had remained adamant, he refused to allow the ceremony to take place on papal territory. It had therefore been agreed that he should meet Honorius outside the walls of Benvento, on the bridge spanning the Sabata River. There, soon after sunset, by the light of countless flaming torches and in the presence, according to Falco, of twenty thousand spectators, the Pope invested Roger with Lance and Gonfalon, just as Pope Nicholas had invested Robert Giscard nearly seventy years before, while the Duke of Apulia, secure at last in his title, placed his hands within those of his suzerain and swore him fealty. Once again, as in Robert's day, Apulia, Calabria and Sicily were united under the same ruler. And he was still only thirty-two. Only one more step remained to be taken. 23 Coronation and so, when the Duke was led in royal state to the cathedral, and was there anointed with the holy oil and invested with the dignity of kingship, the splendor of his majesty and the magnificence of his apparel were beyond the power of words to express or imagination to conceive. Truly it seemed to those who saw him as if all the riches and honors of the world were there assembled. Alexander of Teles, ch. If by granting Roger the investiture of all the territories previously held by Robert Giscard, Pope Honorius had admitted himself beaten, but not all the southern barons were prepared to surrender so easily. The new duke was clever anyone could see that and more cunning even than his uncle had been before him. His military reputation, on the other hand, was still extremely questionable. Ever since his first intrusion into mainland affairs he had displayed a suspicious reluctance to do any real fighting. His successive triumphs had all been won by bribery, diplomacy, speed of movement or slow attrition, it still remained for him to prove himself as a soldier against a determined enemy. Besides, even the Giscard had failed to establish any permanent peace in his domains, and the Giscard had not had Sicily to look after as well. With so large and so remote a duke dukedom under his direct control in addition to the mainland territories and one, moreover, in which he apparently intended to retain his capital the new duke would find it still more difficult to impose his authority. Militarily his investiture was of little significance. Henceforth he might enjoy papal support, but recent events had shown just how little that was worth in terms of effective power. And though South Italy was full of fair weather friends who would bow before him as he passed, there was SDLL not one town or village throughout the peninsula on whose loyalty he could wholly rely in time of crisis. And so, once again, the barons and the cities of Apulia rose up against their lord, and Roger's new dominions, on that historic evening when Pope Honorius entrusted them to his care were already in a state of armed and open rebellion. Roger was beginning to grow accustomed to this state of affairs. Characteristically, he looked upon his dukedom with the eye of an administrator rather than that of a soldier, and he had always known that Apulia, with its enormous fiefs and its traditional hatred of centralized authority, would present a far greater administrative problem than he would ever encounter in Sicily. His task would be to succeed where his uncle had failed and to set up, for the first time in centuries, a strong and enforceable government all through the south, firmly based on the rule of law. Such a task would not be accomplished overnight. But Roger also knew that the very same spirit of independence which had created the problem would also make possible its solution, since it would ensure that his enemies remained divided. Even under the leadership of the Pope they had been unable to act together, now that they were deprived of it they would be more ineffectual still. The few weeks of summer that remained he spent trying to consolidate his position in the north, then, as winter approached, he returned via Salerno to Sicily. In the spring of 1129 he was back, with an army of 3,000 knights and twice that number of infantry including archers and his regiment of Saracens. The ensuing campaign went much as he had planned. Brindisi, admittedly, under the able command of his own cousin, young Geoffrey of Converson O'Connor one withstood his onslaught until the besiegers were forced by hunger to retire, but few other towns seemed disposed to offer much resistance. While Roger's army moved along the coast, mopping up the opposition as it went, 
60 of his ships under George of Antioch blockaded Bari. Its self-styled prince, Grimoald, had been one of the most determined and powerful of the rebels, but early in August he too had to give in. His surrender led to the capitulation of Alexander, Dancad and Geoffrey of Conversano, and the revolt was over. One this Geoffrey, described by the abbot of Telles simply as the son of Count Alexander, may possibly have been of the family of Clermont rather than that of Conversano, but the latter is more likely. Or very nearly. One important city alone remained unsubdued. The people of Troyes to whom, less than two years before, the Pope had granted a commune in return for their support, were reluctant to renounce so soon their newly acquired privileges. Now that Honorius had betrayed them, they looked desperately round for other protectors. First they turned to Capua, but Prince Robert, as might have been expected, was unwilling to antagonize the new Duke of Apulia. Understandably most other barons felt much the same and the Trojans had given up hope of ever finding a champion when there suddenly appeared at their gates the one man who could never resist the chance of adding to his fiefs, whatever the attendant disadvantages Roger's renegade brother-in-law, Rhinul for Valife. Eagerly they accepted his terms protection in return for possession and Rhinulf moved in with his followers. But within a few days his new subjects saw how rash they had been. Roger was already on the march. He did not head straight for Troy that was no longer necessary. An attack on one of the outlying castles was quite enough, as he knew it would be, to bring Rhinulf hurrying to him with peace proposals, and a pact was quickly concluded. The Count of Alife might retain possession of Troy on condition that he held it in fief from his brother-in-law. It was an arrangement eminently satisfactory to both parties. Only the citizens of Troy who now found themselves landed with two liege lords instead of one, had any cause to complain. They had nobody but themselves to blame. Had they known Rhinul for little better they might have guessed that he never intended to hold out against the duke, and that his one idea was to improve his own bargaining position. But it was too late now. Troya, twice betrayed, resisted a few days longer, then, inevitably, it too surrendered. It may seem surprising that Roger should have allowed Rhinulf to get away with so barefaced a coup, particularly after his record over the past two years. The truth is that the Count of Alife, slippery as he was, was no less trustworthy than most of his fellow vassals. Indeed, he may have been slightly more so, if family ties counted for anything and those vassals had somehow to be persuaded to accept the ducal dominion. Roger's task was to win their support, not to antagonize them. His attitude towards his brother-in-law was, in fact, typical of that which he showed in his dealings with the defeated rebels. Outwardly at least for no one ever knew what he was thinking he bore them no malice. Once or twice, as at Brindisi or in the following year at Salerno, he manned the local citadel with a Sicilian garrison to prevent further outbreaks against his authority but there is elsewhere the rebel lords were granted his full pardon and confirmed even Grimoald of Bari in their former possessions. Only among deserters from his own ranks did the duke show unyielding firmness. Some weeks previously another of his cousins, Robert of Grantmsnil, I had withdrawn with his men from the siege of Montalto, ostensibly on the grounds that his fief was too small and he himself too poor support a long campaign. The length of the obligatory period of a vassal's service to his lord was a common ground for complaint and often a genuine cause of hardship, but it was also one of the cornerstones of the feudal system and could not be modified. Roger was not unsympathetic, he even went so far as to promise to increase his cousin's holding as soon as the revolt was crushed. But he was powerless to prevent Robert's defection. The moment peace was restored, he pursued him to his castle at Legopsol and forced his submission. There, before the assembled knights, Robert was obliged to accept a public reprimand, Roger then granted his request for leave to return to Normandy, provided that he renounced all his southern fiefs. It took another year, and another campaign, before the troublesome count was finally banished from Italy, but he had served as a useful example to his fellows. A vassal, once he had sworn fealty to his lord, was bound to him by certain obligations.
for as long as Roger II was Duke of Apulia, no refusal to acknowledge these obligations would be tolerated. One the son of William de Grantmsen Ill and the Giscard's daughter Mabilla. He is not to be confused with his namesake, the guardian of Roger I's first wife, Judith. In September 1129, Duke Roger, his authority at last firmly established, summoned all the bishops, abbots, and counts of Apulia and Calabria to a solemn court at Melfi. It was the first of a series of such courts that would mark his reign, and its purpose was to lay the foundations of his future government in South Italy. Each of his vassals in turn was now required, in the presence of his assembled fellows, to swear a great oath not only confirming his feudal obligations but, in the interests of pacification, carrying them a stage further. The precise wording of this oath is, alas, lost to us but it seems to have fallen into three main parts. It began with the normal swearing of fealty and obedience, first to the duke himself and then to each of his two eldest sons who had accompanied him young Roger, now about eleven years old, and Tancred, a year or two younger. There followed a specific undertaking to observe a ducal edict now promulgated forbidding all private war that favourite pursuit among members of the knightly class with which so much of their time and energy was normally occupied. Finally the counts were made to swear to uphold order and justice by withholding their aid from thieves, robbers and all who sought to despoil the land, by surrendering them to the duke's courts wherever they might be established, and by promising their protection to all feudal inferiors, clerical or lay, as well as to all pilgrims, travellers and merchants. It was a compendious oath and even more far-reaching than appears at first sight. The swearing of fealty was usual enough, though even here it is interesting that Roger should have specifically involved the two young princes, thereby strengthening their claims to the eventual succession and, perhaps, giving a first hint of his future policy of setting up his sons as viceroys over the mainland. He also made it abundantly clear that what he was demanding of his vassals was something more than a formality. In the years to come we find him imposing this oath, time and time again, not only on the barons and knights but on all three classes of his subjects, as a constant reminder of their duty. Was he, by this continued insistence, already moving towards that exalted, semi-mystical concept of kingship on the Byzantine model, which so appealed to his oriental spirit and which, in his later years, he was so successfully to realize? it is possible. What is certain is that he was, deliberately or not, preparing the way for the extended theory of treason which was peculiar, in the 12th century, to the Sicilian monarchy. Eleven Evelyn Jamison, the Norman administration of Apulia and Capua. But the real significance of the court of Melfi is to be found not in the first but in the second section of the vassal's oath. It had occasionally happened in the past that the South Italian barons had sworn usually for a strictly limited period to respect the rights and property of the non-knightly classes, but they had always preserved the right of feud, by which they could and did make war on each other to their heart's content. Only when a pope promulgated the so-called Trugadi, the truce of God, could they sometimes be persuaded to suspend these activities. In recent years at least three popes urban. Pascal and Calixtus had tried by this means to halt the decline of Apulia into anarchy, but none of them had been conspicuously successful, if only because the maintenance of such a truce depended entirely on voluntary oaths sworn by the various parties concerned. This time it was different. The right of feud was abolished from above, at one stroke and forever an achievement at that time unparalleled in Europe outside England and Normandy. The oath accepting this abolition was sworn to Roger personally, and thus was brought into being the Duke's peace, for which he himself assumed the ultimate responsibility, both in its maintenance and in the punishment of those by whom it should be disturbed for the third part of the oath, with its reference to the surrender of malefactors to the Duke's courts, made it clear that Roger had no intention, even now, of relying solely on the honour of his feudatories. This was the beginning of his penal code, and he intended to give it teeth. The first great assembly of Melfi, at which in 1043 the pioneer generation of Norman barons, 
with Roger's uncle William the Iron Arm at their head and Gaimer of Salerno as their suzerain, had divided their conquered territories into the twelve counties of Apulia, had long since passed into history. The May, however, have been a few old men in the little hill town who still dimly remembered that august day just seventy years before when Robert Giscard, colossal in his prime, had received his three duchies from Pope Nicholas II. Both of these occasions had marked new chapters in the epic of the Norman domination of South Italy. Here, now, was a third. This time there were no investitures, no allocations of fiefs, but there was, for every Norman knight and baron present, the same unmistakable intimation that one era was past and another just beginning. It cannot have been an altogether welcome sensation. The old ways, the chaotic legacy of Roger Borsa and his son, might have proved disastrous for the security and prosperity of the land as a whole, but for the privileged classes they had often been agreeable and profitable enough. Now, for the first time in forty-five years, the South found at its head a strong man, able and determined to rule. Things would be different in future. The year 1129, already an annus mirabilis for Roger, was to end with a further triumph. The position of Capula had been ambiguous ever since the death of its prince, Richard II, in 1106. Now Richard had, eight years before, recognized the suzerainty of the Duke of Apulia in return for help in his reinstatement, but his successors do not seem to have followed his example, and neither Roger Borsa nor Duke William was of the caliber to assert their claims. Thus, by default, Capula had once again become an independent state the sovereignty of which Roger, by the terms of his Benvento investiture, had bound himself to respect. How long he would in fact have done so is an open question, Capua, though now but a poor shadow of its former self and constituting no conceivable military threat, remained an irritation and an obstacle to the complete unification of the South which sooner or later he would surely have found intolerable. Fortunately the matter was decided for him. The gutless young Robert, finding himself now entirely bereft of allies, decided to come to terms with his neighbor before it was too late, and voluntarily recognized the duke as his lawful suzerain. This unsolicited submission, which effectively reunited Capula with the Duchy of Apulia and so left Roger the undisputed master of the Norman South marked the final frustration of all Honorius IP's efforts to maintain the tenuous balance of power, and it might well have been expected to provoke angry reactions from Rome. But by the time the news of Prince Robert's capitulation reached the Lateran, Honorius was lying desperately ill, and in the months that followed months that would bring the Duke of Apulia the greatest prize of his career the Papal Curia would find itself saddled with other more urgent preoccupations. The Jewish colony has existed in Rome uninterruptedly since the days of Pompey. Having first settled in Trastevere, by the Middle Ages it had already crossed the river and now occupied that same quarter on the left bank, just opposite the island which Pope Paul IV was later to enclose as a ghetto and in which its synagogue still stands. Nowadays, as it slowly recovers from its recent sufferings, it presents little enough evidence of prosperity, but in the early 12th century Roman Jewry enjoyed, by reason of its enormous wealth, both influence and prestige within the papal city. Preeminent among its leading families was that of the Pirini, whose close connections with succeeding popes had led them, the better part of a century before, to embrace the Christian faith, and since that time the continuance of the papal favor, assisted by the panoply and splendor with which they surrounded themselves, had raised them to a social and financial position at which they admitted no superiors among the most illustrious princely houses of Rome. One distinction only was still lacking but that the most important distinction of all. The Pelionis had not yet themselves produced a pope. The omission was understandable in the circumstances, but it would have to be rectified. For some years, therefore, their eyes had been hopefully fixed on the most brilliant of their scions, a certain Peter de Pelioni who was rising rapidly in the hierarchy. His qualifications were excellent. His father had been a trusted lieutenant of Gregory VII, and he himself, after a period of study in Paris under the great Abelard himself, had become a monk at Cluny, 
recalled to Rome in 1120, he had been appointed cardinal by Pascal II at his father's request and had subsequently served as papal legate first in France and then in England, where he had appeared with a particularly splendid retinue at the court of King Henry I. Henry seems to have been impressed, if we are to believe William of Malmesbury, the cardinal returned to Rome so laden with rich presents as to cause raised eyebrows at the curia. There is in fact no evidence to suggest that Pierlini was more venal or corrupt than any other of the contemporary princes of the church, on the contrary, his genuine piety and irreproachable cluniac background had made him a staunch upholder of many aspects of reform. One but he was capable, strong-willed and intensely ambitious, and, like every potential candidate for the throne of St. Peter, he had enemies. Of these the most dangerous were the Hildebrandine party what might be called the left wing of the Curia who feared that a Pierlini Pope would lead the papacy back into its bad old ways until it became once again the tool or even the plaything of the Roman aristocracy, and his family's most implacable rivals, that other formidable brood of fellow upstarts the Franipani. One other more outspoken accusations, by such robust prelates as Manfred of Mancha or Arnulf of Lysiux who actually wrote a book called Invectives, to the effect that the cardinal seduced nuns, slept with his sister, etc., can be discounted as being simply the normal, healthy church polemic of the kind to be expected at times of schism. By the beginning of February 1130 it was clear that Pope Honorius was near his end, and Cardinal Pelliani, who enjoyed the support of many of the sacred college, most of the nobility and practically all the lower orders in Rome among whom his carefully dispensed generosity had become proverbial, was the obvious successor. But the opposition was taking no chances. Led by the Chancellor of the Curia, Cardinal Amory to whom we last met, with Sensius Franipani, negotiating with Roger II on the banks of the Bradano they seized the dying pontiff and carried him off to the monastery of St. Andrew, safe in the center of the Franipani quarter where they would be able to conceal his death until suitable dispositions had been made for the future. Three next, on the 11th of February, Amory summoned to the monastery such cardinals as he felt he could trust and began preparations for the new election. Now such a proceeding, apart from being manifestly dishonest, was also a flagrant breach of Pope Nicholas's decree of 1059, and it provoked an immediate reaction from the rest of the curia hurling anathemas against all those who would proceed to the election before the funeral of Honorius, they thereupon nominated a commission of eight electors of all parties who, they decreed, should meet in the church of St. Adrian not St. Andrew when, and only when, the Pope had been safely laid in his grave. Two, Amory was a Frenchman, and I have therefore preferred the French version of his name. He is often called Amoric, or Hameric, in the German fashion. Three, this monastery was founded by Gregory the Great. The site is now part of the Church of S. Gregorio Magno, to the left of which there stands among the cypresses a chapel still dedicated to St. Andrew, traditionally on the site of Gregory's original oratory. Opposite, at the end of the Circus Maximus, a ruined tower marks the site of the old Franipani fortress. This refusal to countenance an election at St. Andrews was clearly due to the unwillingness of Cardinal Pelliani and his adherents to put themselves at the mercy of the Franipani, but when they arrived at St. Adrian's they found the situation no better there. Amory's men had already taken possession of the whole place and had fortified it against them. Furious. They turned away and accompanied now by several other cardinals who had no particular love for Pelliani but were outraged by the conduct of the Chancellor gathered instead at the old church of S. Marco, where they settled down to await developments. On the 13th of February the rumour swept through Rome that the Pope was dead at last, and that the news was being deliberately suppressed. An angry crowd gathered outside St. Andrews and was dispersed only after poor Honorius had shown himself, trembling and haggard, on his balcony. It was his last public appearance. The strain had been too much for him, and by nightfall he was dead. In theory his body should have been allowed to he for three days in state, but since the election of a new pope could not take place before the burial of the old, Aimed had no time for such niceties.
Almost before the corpse was cold it was flung into a temporary grave in the courtyard of the monastery, and early the following morning the Chancellor and those who shared his views elected to the papacy Gregory, Cardinal Deacon of S. Angelo. He was rushed to the Lateran and formally, if somewhat hastily, installed under the title of Innocent II, he then retreated to S. Maria in Palladio now S. Sebastiano in Palaria where, thanks to the Frenipani, he could keep out of harm's way. The lovely 9th century Basilica of S. Marco in Rome has suffered as grievously as most of its fellows from the indignities of Baroque restoration, but its great apse mosaic still glows as glorious as ever, and the church itself offers a haven of silence and peace after the tumult of the Piazza Venezia outside. The atmosphere must have been very different on the morning of St. Valentine's Day 1130, when the news of Honorius's death and innocent succession was brought to those assembled within its walls. Their numbers had been steadily growing, and they now comprised virtually all the high dignitaries of the church apart from those who had sided with Amory including some two dozen cardinals together with most of the nobility and as many of the populace as could squeeze their way through the doors. With one accord the cardinals declared the proceedings at St. Andrews and the latter an uncanonical, and acclaimed Cardinal Pierlini as their rightful pope. He accepted at once, taking the name of an Anacletus too. At dawn that morning there had been no pope in Rome. By midday there were two dot innocent or an Acletus it is hard to say which candidate possessed the stronger claim to the papacy. An Acletus, certainly, could boast more overall support, both among the cardinals and within the church as a whole. On the other hand those who had voted for innocent, though fewer in number, had included the majority of the electoral commission of eight which had been set up by the sacred college. The manner in which they had performed their duties was to say the least questionable, but then an Anacletus's own election could scarcely have been described as orthodox. It had, moreover, taken place at a time when another pope had already been elected and installed. One thing was certain. In Rome itself, sweetened by years of bribery, the popularity of an Anacletus was overwhelming. By the 15th of February he and his party were in control of the Lateran, and on the 16th they took St. Peter's itself. Here, a week later, he received his formal consecration while his rival, whose place of refuge had already been the object of armed attacks by Anacletus's partisans, had to be content with a similar but more modest ceremony at S. Maria Novla. Day by day Anacletus entrenched himself more firmly, while his agents dispensed subsidies with an ever more generous hand, until at last his gold is supplemented, according to his enemies, by the wholesale pillage of the principal churches of Rome found its way into the Franipani fortress itself. Deserted by his last remaining champions, Innocent had no choice but to flee. Already by the beginning of April we find him dad his letters from Trastevere, a month later he had secretly hired two galleys, on which, accompanied by all his loyal cardinals except one, he escaped down the Tiber. His flight proved his salvation. Anacletus might have bought Rome, but elsewhere in Italy popular feeling was firmly behind Innocent. In Pisa he was cheered to the echo, in Genoa the same, and while his rival lauded it in the Lateran he himself was now free to canvass support where it most mattered beyond the Alps. From Genoa he took ship for France and by the time he sailed into the time harbour of St. Gilles in Provence much of his old confidence had returned. It was well justified. When he found, awaiting him at St. Gilles, a deputation from Cluny with sixty horses and mules in its train ready to escort him the two hundred odd miles to the monastery he must have felt that, at least so far as France was concerned, his battle was as good as won. If the most influential of all French abbeys was prepared to give him its support in preference to one of its own sons, he had little to fear from other quarters, and when the Council of Etamps, summoned in the late summer to give a final ruling, formally declared in his favour, it did little more than confirm a foregone conclusion. France then was sound, but what of the empire? Here lay the key to Innocent's ultimate success, and here Lothair the Saxon, King of Germany, showed no particular eagerness to make up his mind.
his inclinations and background should have predisposed him favorably enough, he had long upheld the ecclesiastical and populist party among the German princes, and had received in return the support of Honorius II and Chancellor Amory. On the other hand, he was still engaged in a desperate struggle for power with Conrad of Hohenstaufen, who had been elected king in opposition to him three years before, and he had to weigh his actions with care. Besides, he had not yet been crowned emperor in Rome. To antagonize the pope who actually held the city was a step that might have dangerous implications. Innocent, however, was not unduly worried, for his case was by now safely in the hands of the most powerful of all advocates and the outstanding spiritual force of the 12th century Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Later in this story we shall have to take a closer look at Saint Bernard, whose influence on European affairs in the next quarter century was to be so immense and, in many respects, so disastrous. For the moment let it suffice to say that he had thrown all his formidable energies, all the weight of his moral and political prestige, into the scales on innocence behalf. With such a champion the Pope could afford to be patient and allow events to take their course. The same, however, could not be said for an Ecletus. He too was conscious of the need for international recognition, particularly in Northern Europe, but whereas Innocent was able to whip up support in person, he had had to rely on correspondence, and he had so far been singularly unsuccessful. In an effort to reassure King Lothair he had even gone so far as to excommunicate his rival Conrad, but the king had been unimpressed and had not even had the courtesy to answer his subsequent letters. In France, too, his legates were snubbed, and now, as reports reached him of more and more declarations for innocent, he began to grow seriously alarmed. The weight of the opposition was far greater than he had expected, and, more disturbing still, it was not only the ruling princes who appeared to favor his antagonist, but the church itself. During the past fifty years, thanks largely to the Cluniac reforms and to the influence of Hildebrand, the church had shaken off the shackles imposed on it by Roman aristocrats and German princelings, and had suddenly developed into a strong and cohesive international authority. Simultaneously the mushroom growth of the religious orders had given it a new efficiency and impetus. Cluny under Abbot Peter the Venerable, Primator under Norbert of Magdeburg, he who had persuaded Lothair to leave Anacletus's letters unanswered, Cytax under Saint Bernard all were vital, positive forces. All three were united in favor of innocent, and they carried the body of the church with them. And so Anacletus took the only course open to him, like many another desperate pope in the past, he turned to the Normans. In September 1130, just about the time when the Council of Etamps was deciding in Innocent's favor, he left Rome via Benvento for Avellino, where Roger was waiting to receive him. The negotiations were soon completed. They may have been carefully prepared in advance, on the other hand the main issues were simple enough and can have called for time discussion. The Duke of Apulia would give Anacletus his support, in return, he demanded one thing only a royal crown. The request was prompted by something far deeper than personal vanity. Roger's task was to weld together all the Norman dominions of the south into one nation. The resulting state could be nothing less than a kingdom, to maintain the identities of three separate duchies would be to invite disintegration. Moreover, if he were not a king, how would he be able to treat on equal terms with the other rulers of Europe and the East? Domestic considerations pointed in the same direction. He must have a title that would set him above his senior vassals, the princes of Capua and Bari, one that would bind all his feudatories to him with a loyalty deeper than that which a mere duke could command. Briefly, he needed kingship not just for its own sake but for the sake of the mystique surrounding it. But the Pope remained and would remain his suzerain, and he knew that if he were to assume a crown without the papal blessing, his prestige, far from being enhanced, would be gravely endangered. Anacletus was sympathetic. If, as now seemed likely, the Duke of Apulia was to be his only ally, it was plainly desirable that his position should be strengthened to the utmost. And his claims were incontrovertible. There was no reason for delay.
On the 27th of September, back at Benvento, he issued a bull granting to Roger and his heirs the crown of Sicily, Calabria and Apulia, comprising all those regions which the Dukes of Apulia had ever held of the Holy See, together with the Principality of Capua, the honour of Naples a deliberately ambiguous phrase, since Naples, still technically independent and with vague Byzantine affiliations, was not the Pope's to endow the assistance of the papal city of Benvento in time of war. The seat of the kingdom would be in Sicily, and the coronation ceremony might be performed by the Sicilian archbishops. In return Roger pledged his homage and fealty to Anacletus as Pope, together with an annual tribute of 600 Sifati a sum equivalent to about 160 ounces of gold. It remained only for Roger to make similar dispositions with his own vassals. He was determined that no one should be able, now or in the future, to charge him with usurpation. Returning to Salerno, he therefore called another assembly on an only slightly smaller scale than that which had met at Mel the previous year, SDLL comprising all the senior and most trustworthy nobles and clerics and probably including representatives of the chief cities and towns. To them he submitted proposals for his elevation, which they unanimously accepted. It may have been a formality, but similar formalities had been traditional preliminaries to coronations in England, one France and Germany for two centuries, and to Roger it was vital. However much his personal sympathies and upbringing might have inclined him towards the Byzantine concept of absolute rule, he knew that he could win the support of his Norman barons only by presenting them with an unexceptionable, legally constituted monarchy as it was understood in the West. Now that he had been acclaimed at Salerno his legal and moral position was, he knew, as secure as he could possibly make it. He had the approval of both church and state, of his suzerain and of his vassals. He was free to go ahead. One acclamation of the monarch is still, 800 years later, an integral part of the English coronation service. It was, wrote the abbot of Telles, who was there, as if the whole city was being crowned. The streets were spread with carpets, the balconies and terraces were festooned in every colour. Palermo was thronged with the king's vassals, great and small, from Apulia and Calabria, all of whom had received a royal summons to the capital for the great day, each trying to outdo his rivals in the magnificence of his train and the splendour of his entourage, with wealthy merchants, who saw in this huge concourse possibilities of gain that might never be paralleled in their lifetime with craftsmen and artisans, townsmen and peasants from every corner of the kingdom, drawn by curiosity and excitement and wonder, Italians, Germans, Normans, Greeks, Lombards, Spaniards, Saracens, all adding to the clamour and colour of what was already the most exotic and cosmopolitan city of Europe. Through such crowds as these, on Christmas Day 1130, King Roger II of Sicily rode to his coronation. In the cathedral there awaited him the Archbishop of Palermo and all the Latin hierarchy of his realm, together with representatives of the Greek church to which he had always shown such favour. Anacletus's special envoy, the Cardinal of S. Sabina, first anointed him with the holy oil, then Prince Robert of Capua, his vassal-in-chief, laid the crown upon his head. Finally the great doors of the cathedral were flung open and, for the first time in history, the people of Sicily gazed upon their king. The crisp winter air was loud with the cheering of the populace, the pealing of the bells and the jangle of the gold and silver trappings on the seemingly endless cavalcade which escorted the king back to the palace. Thither his guests followed him, and there, in a great hall that glowed red with scarlet and purple hangings he presided at a banquet the like of which had never before been seen in Palermo. The abbot records with amazement how there was not one dish for the meats, not one cup for the wines, that was not of the purest gold or silver, while the servants, even those who waited at the tables, were resplendent in garments of silk. Now that Roger was at last a king, he found it both agreeable and politic to five like one. Coronations are normally less likely to mark the ends of stories than their beginnings, that of King Roger does both. He was to reign for another 23 years.
during the greater part of which his life would continue in much the same way as before in building up his own position and that of his country, in playing off successive popes and emperors against one another, and in ceaselessly struggling, as his father and uncle had struggled before him, to keep his vassals under adequate control. But the 25th of December 1130 nevertheless represents something more than a convenient point at which to pause. On that day the object for which the Hortevilles had so long striven subconsciously perhaps, but striven nonetheless was achieved, henceforth Sicily seems to radiate a new confidence, a new awareness of her place in Europe and of the mission she has to fulfill. The chronicles become fuller and more informative, the characters recover their flesh and blood and the cultural genius that was Norman Sicily's chief legacy to the world bursts at last into the fullness of its flower. The years of attainment are ended, the years of greatness begin. Bibliographer notes on the principal sources Amatus, Amy, of Monte Cassino Amatus lived as a monk at the monastery of Monte Cassino during the second half of the 11th century. He was thus presumably an eyewitness of many of the events he chronicles, and is consequently the best source for the early history of the Norman conquest of Italy, covering the period from its beginnings to 1080. His main object is avowedly to tell of the glories of Robert Giscard and Richard of Capua, but his facts seem to be generally accurate. The original Latin text of Amatus's work has been lost, but there exist at the Bibliothèque Nationale two early 14th century copies of a translation into an Italianate Old French. The work has never to my knowledge been translated into English. Geoffrey Malatra a Benedictine monk of Norman origin, Malatra seems to have come to Apulia as a young man and later to have settled at Robert Giscard's foundation of S. Euphemia, from which he eventually moved to its daughter house, S. Agatu at Catania. At the outset he makes it clear that he is writing on the instructions of Count Roger I and that his chronicle is based not on documents but on oral tradition and hearsay, it is therefore not surprising that the first part should be rather vague. After 1060, however, his narrative tightens. Apart from one longish digression about Robert Giscard's Byzantine expedition, he is now dealing with Roger in Sicily to the exclusion of all else, and may well be recording on occasion the Count's own reminiscences, at any rate he is the best indeed, practically the only source for Roger's Sicilian wars and, in view of his semi-official standing, he is presumably fairly trustworthy. His chronicle stops in 1099. No English or French translations exist. William of Apulia William's epic poem was written at the instigation of Pope Urban II and is dedicated to Roger Borsa. It can be dated fairly accurately to the last few years of the 11th century probably between 1095 and 1099. It tells the story from the beginning until the death of Robert Giscard in 1085, and the return of Roger Borsa and the army to Italy. Unlike other pro-Norman chroniclers of the period, William was an Italian, Chalandon suggests that he came from Giovinazzo, which certainly seems to get more than its share of favorable mentions. Relying largely on local sources, he is particularly useful where events in Apulia are concerned, he is less good on western Italy and Sicily. His work has two main themes the providential succession of the Byzantines by the Normans, and the glorification of the House of Horteville. There is a French translation by Marguerite Mathy, see below. Leo of Ostia Leo Marsicanus came from a noble family of the Marci and entered Monte Cassino in about 1061. Forty years later Pascal II created him Cardinal Bishop of Ostia. He was a personal friend of Abbot Desiderius, at whose request he wrote his chronicle of the monastery and to whom it is dedicated. Although the work was begun only after 1098. Leo's first draft takes no note of Amatus and is based on archives and oral traditions. Later, however, he seems to have come across his predecessor's work and rewrote much of his own in consequence, bringing his account up to the year 1075. It was subsequently continued by Peter the Deacon, who, though he was to become a librarian of the monastery and to play an important part in its affairs, proved an unscrupulous and untrustworthy chronicler. Chalandon, 
in a rare burst of feeling, speaks of his detestable reputation. Leo's own work, however, is well informed and of considerable value. There is no English or French translation. Falco of Benvento, member of one of the leading families of Benvento, a palace notary and scribe, Falco wrote a retrospective history of his own city and South Italy as a whole between 1102 and 1139. It is of interest not only for its own qualities it is reliable, methodical, vivid, and contains much of which its author was an eyewitness but also because it reflects the opinions of a Lombard patriot, for whom the Normans were little better than a bunch of uncivilized brigands. An Italian translation exists and is listed below. Alexander of Telles Alexander, abbot of the monastery of S. Salvatore near Telles, wrote his chronicle at the request of the Countess Matilda, sister of Roger II. Though ostensibly a biography of Roger, the first part is sketchy in the extreme, we are told nothing about Adelaide's regency and the account becomes interesting only from 1127, with the events leading up to the establishment of the Sicilian kingdom. From that point until 1136, when Alexander abruptly breaks off, he becomes a valuable source though allowance must be made for his extreme tendentiousness. For him Roger was divinely appointed to bring peace and order to the south, after meeting out just punishment for earlier iniquities. Despite his cloth, the abbot has little respect for the pope, and even chides Honorius II for his insolence. There is an Italian translation listed below.